spins a web any size. Catch your seeds just like flies. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amazing Spider-Man Classics in association with SpiderManCrawlspace.com. My name is John Wilson, and with me are Donovan Morgan Grant. Back again. Yes, like a boss. Like a boss. <laughs> like and, a boss. Assuming the vacuum has stopped, Joshua Lappin Bertoni. It has not. It is spring cleaning over here in Amazing Spider-Man Classics. <laughs> but one thing that isn't going to be cleaned is our language. Look out, folks. Uh-oh. We talk about a lot of stuff. We try to keep the language. No, the language actually, the word choices are clean. The word content is totally not. Um, <laughs> like a lube. Wow. And I want to remind you that every episode of Amazing Spider-Man Classics is brought to you by Roll to Play, your online source for games and gaming accessories. Currently, they are offering a 10% off deal on all Settlers of Catan games. One featured item is the Catan Dice Game. You discover, explore, and settle Catan anywhere and anytime, even solo. The Catan Dice Game is a fast, fun way to experience Catan on the go. You can play it in only 15 or 30 minutes. It's a great casual introduction to the world of Catan before diving into the big boxes. That is 10% off at Roll2Play.com. You can also find the store on Facebook if you search Roll2Play, all one word, spelled with the number 2. This is episode 29 of the show, and not 38. Because you see, if I had managed to get three episodes out every month for a year like I wanted to, we'd be on 38 right now, and farther through the series. So, sorry. We have managed to lose three months of episodes due to scheduling conflicts and school conflicts and other such things. But, you know, stuff happens and hobbies sometimes have to wait. We Um, had Fred Van Lente fill in a few podcasts for us because we were sick. Right. We hope you enjoyed the Spider-Man commentary that you heard last episode that we have not yet recorded. Hello from the past! (laughs) And... For our first I had a great time on my cruise, everybody. <laughs> that you haven't taken yet. For our first actual episode of the new, is it fiscal year, whatever you want to call it, we have with us a guest. This is a man who has followed the show from its early days. He is a college professor who not only brings comics into his lectures when they fit, but also does writings and publications about comics as literature. Please say hello to Dr. Bond Benton. Hey, how's it going? I'm just going to call you Dr. Bond from now on, because that sounds... That totally works. Totally works. (laughs) (laughs) So, Bond, thank you very much for being with us. How did you come to be here? What is your... um, How did you get into comics and such? What do you like about Spider-Man and that sort of thing? Uh, It goes all the way back to uh, Christmas uh, when I was five. Underoos were brand new at the time, and they were pretty like they were pretty janky back in the day. It was pretty much just a blue pair of underwears and like a really crappily silk screened Spider Man top. But I got it, and that was for me just pure win, right? Like I walked around the house in this underoo outfit with Spider Man on it. I knew I was hooked from then on. I went to college. I did my master's and my PhD. Wait, are you They're still wearing much- the un- are you still wearing yeah, the underoos at this point when you go to college? Well, I, I really only do it to sex up the wife, but for the most part, yeah, like, like, yeah the, the underoos are are totally part of my game. Um, but I, I did all of the the studying. I, I accumulated just massive student loan debt for the purpose of being paid to write and talk about uh, comic books and uh, to charge all of my comic book purchases to a university. Um, so um, that's kind of like my thing. the The podcast is great, and I'm really looking forward to being a part of it. And thanks so much for inviting me. What got you into – well, um, you said that you got the Spider-Man underoos. How did you uh, discover the comics and find all that with Spider-Man? Do you remember what like, your first purchases were or anything? What the one that yeah, one that got me was um, – uh, do you remember uh, – I don't know if anybody knows this – Power Records? Yes. Yeah, Power Records were these kind of like read-along comic book things, and I just collected the heck out of them. And My favorite one was uh, Spider-Man, and it was something about like I think the bells of some period where they, they had sort of like really loud cathedral bells that just like really screwed up everything. Uh, but I listened the heck out of that, and, and this really, really you know excited my passion about it. I'll be honest, this show, 
this particular podcast, like looking back at the old stuff and realizing how good some of the early Stan Lee stuff was, despite its obvious kitschiness, was was like a really big reason. Like I got interested in the early the early stuff, um, and I've just been like hooked ever since. Yeah, it's been a good time. Well, good. Well, we are definitely glad to have you here on the show with us. Before we get to our issues that we're going to be talking about today, we do have some emails that we want to read. We actually have quite the stack of messages since it's been so long since we recorded an email segment, so I don't know if we're going to get through all of them today, but do keep writing in. We are committed to reading every message we receive, so um, let's see Within how... reason. <laughs> If you write again asking Josh to do unspeakable things to you, we're not going to read that on the on the on the air. So just stop doing that. Nigerian princes are welcome. Okay, from a Mr. Timothy Flood. Hey, I love the show, and we're most disconcerted over the month you couldn't put out shows, dude. So are we. Another <laughs> thing, I'm watching an episode of Avengers Earth Mightiest Heroes. Jam was talking to Hank and something to effect of, "My money pays for this." This Hank chimes in, "Science!" while raising a finger in the air. I could hardly stop laughing long enough to write this. Thanks again for all the work you guys do. This show is one of my most favorite things to listen to. I caught that too. Yeah, I actually seen that episode. I. I was like, hey! If it weren't for the fact that an animated episode takes like a bajillion months to make, I would almost wonder if they had listened to our show before making that episode. But I realize that that's so unlikely that it doesn't bear looking at. Exactly. Next email is from Eric Gentry, titled Peter's Microscope. I was happy to hear you mention the continuity error regarding Peter's microscope because it gives me a chance to explain it away. Mm. He, left it on, he left it on Uncle Ben's grave in 181, but then Aunt May donated it to a church in 290. My no prize explanation? During Secret Wars 2, after Peter showed the Beyonder how to use the toilet, <laughs> the Beyonder used his powers to restore the microscope back to Aunt May's... Really? <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. The Beyonder used no, his no, powers... No, 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 no. This, this is his explanation. This wasn't an incontinuity explanation. Was the oh. toilet thing in the story? Oh, um, the, Peter did teach the Beyonder how to use the bathroom. Oh lord! Think of, yeah, uh, no, are you, that's one of the funniest things ever. I'll have to send you a scan of it. Okay, because I haven't read Secret Wars two. I'm up to 1981 in my reading of Spider Man. Secret Wars two is like a sitcom. It's like he has all the powers of a god, but now he has to mm, live a normal life as a human <laughs> being. <laughs> Still funny. Okay, but no, um, uh, but this next sentence that Don's about to read, no, this is the guy's no prize explanation. Oh, okay, I gotcha. And that ex- explanation is, the Beyonder used his powers to restore the microscope back to Aunt May's house, unbeknownst to Peter, in order to thank him, because he knew it would inspire Peter to propose to Mary Jane. Can Bertone talk that? Unfortunately, um, <laughs> there actually is an official continuity explanation in place. Um, I thought I had mentioned it on one of the previous episodes, but the microscope that was left on Uncle Ben's grave was a replica. That's the official continuity explanation that Marvel has given, and that the real microscope was the one from 290. Why Peter left a replica of a microscope? What is a replica of a microscope, anyways? Isn't that just it's another, another freaking microscope? microscope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a store-bought toy. Yeah. The, the, so basically, really he left the microscope that Uncle Ben didn't buy him on Uncle Ben's grave. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like the groundskeeper somebody found it and was like wow this will help teach my son about science his son must have been like really disappointed when he saw that it was just a replica yeah, i still go with the idea that somebody that aunt may or even peter went back and got the stupid microscope and took it home because leaving a microscope in a graveyard was silly you do that with flowers you don't do it with microscopes i think well, the idea that it's, 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 it was blown up when um or did he move it out? Because I, I, the last time I saw it was in Marvel Knights, and I guess it was blown up when um, Tops around that time, but maybe not. <sighs> Who knows? Dan Slott actually. <laughs> I feel really bad saying this because I feel like that this is bashing. So, John, I'll, I'll leave it up to your discretion if you want to keep this in or not. But Dan Slott has actually said, like in an interview, that a lot of writers have wanted to use the microscope and bring it back. But Slott has personally stopped them, saying that the microscope is at Uncle Ben's grave as of issue 181. <laughs> so it's like, I'm like, oh, so 
but there's the retcon, and he has the microscope. He got it back in 290. So well, I'm sure that, 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 those issues. We, we all know that. I'm, I guess in Slot's personal continuity, though, like he doesn't like the replica. Uh, I have to think explanation. that I'm, I, I'm not going to consider that bashing Slot because I have to think that lots of things like that happen in editorial offices, and they just don't make it on the internet because the internet didn't exist yet. That's just you know. So I'm, I'm not going to consider that bat, Slot bashing. It's just he has a mistake in his head, and I've been wrong before. I think like twice now. Um, Empire State University. Right, right. Sally so, Avril. <laughs> no, I, I didn't what was say he anything about, about Sally Avril. <laughs> I wasn't wrong about Sally Avril. I was just surprised to find. Uh, that's, 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 just, uh, that's just one of my favorite gags on the show. That's my attention. I, I saw a thread on CBR about like Peter's high school classmates, and there was a whole conversation. What about Sally Avril? And somebody's like, "Oh, she's dead." I send it yeah. to John. <laughs> she's dead. Okay, so this next email is entitled Episode Twenty Two. Which one was Twenty Two? I don't remember. The, uh, the first Master Plan um, episode. He, he says, talks about the Harry, so yeah, I guess. He says, Gentlemen, I have been listening to your shows since the beginning, and have to admit I thought it was getting kind of dull. I mean, it's okay and all, I guess, if you like all that talky-talky blah-blah-blah, Spider-Man this, Spider-Man that sort of thing. Actually, now that I think about it, it does help me to fall asleep on those nights when the sound of Michael Bailey's voice on any one of his myriad of podcasts just isn't doing the trick. Ouch. Yeah. But then, then, I heard Amazing Spider-Man Classics Episode 22, and I couldn't believe my ears. Wow, you guys scored Scott Gardner of Two True Freaks. I love that guy. He's my favorite. He's my favorite. That's my hippo for the day. Really? In fact, I am the founder, president, CEO, and treasurer of the Scott Gardner Fan Club. Incidentally. Oh, yeah, their meetings are at Mr. Brandt's club. (laughs) <laughs> Forest Hills chapter, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Incidentally, we'd be happy to have you guys as members, provided you could each individually meet an appropriate sign-up donation sum, of course. In any case, Scott Gardner was great, as always, and was just what this show really needed, star power. We're not doing the star comics on this show, just so you know. Good yeah. job, fellas. If this doesn't catapult you guys to the top of the podcasting ratings chart, I don't know what will. More Scott Gardner, please. Signed, Scott Gardner. <laughs> he loves Scott Gardner so much that he changed his name. <laughs> P.S. Thanks for having me, guys. Scott, it was great to have you, and we look forward to having you on again soon. So, yes, we need to make that happen. That's great. I also listen to shows. He was... Um Co-host Two True Freaks, Back to the Bends, and Tales of the Justice Society of America, and his own solo show, Death and the Acrid Smell of Gunsmoke, the Jonah Hex Podcast, which are all found at twotruefreaks.libson.com. Yes. It's a great collection. Association of DeMonso Corps of Milan, Italy, and from the letters, well, (laughs) listen listen to the show and you'll find out. Um, I think Back to the Bends might actually be on an indefinite hiatus. But two true, but the uh, the two fruit true freaks and tales of the JSA and Jonah Hex um, are both being worked on even as we speak. Sheila Smith, dear ASM, hey Spidey Classics, just want to say I'm a big fan of yours. Listening to your podcast is a lot of fun, and I enjoy hearing things that I know and being surprised when I hear something cool that I didn't know. I usually know lots of stuff because I've been a Spider-Man fan for pretty much my whole life. Get this, I'm. 12 years old holy crap so i love reading along and you guys are super funny i love teenage wasteland and golden age superman by the way did you see the new suit for the spider-man reboot please tell me your thoughts anyway until there is another clone saga oh there will be make mine marvel (laughs) and amazing spider-man classics sign ethan smith thanks for listening ethan um, I hope your mother doesn't find out about all the raunchy jokes that we make in your presence. <laughs> and I hope you don't know what those mean anyway. <laughs> Her mouth is probably fouler than ours. Oh, okay. I, I'm glad you're speaking so highly of his mother. Yeah, that actually is, is probably more insulting than it was intended to be. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Smith. <laughs> what do we think of the new Spider-Man costume? I haven't actually ha- heard y'all's thoughts on this. Um Let's go with Bond first. Bond, have you seen the pictures of the new Spider-Man costume? I got them up right now. Uh, I'll go with you guys first for a second. From what I understand, that's not like the suit in action. That's just like a stunt suit for CGI purposes or something. So 
I'm at least that's what I've heard, so I'm withholding judgment. No, there 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 was just a release today, even an, an official official poster image. Yeah, go go to that link. Yeah. And loading, loading. You're gonna get my off the cuff reaction, everybody. Yeah, I, I think Kimmich is pretty cool right here. <laughs> The colors not being where they're supposed to be is, like, hurting my OCD-ness, but, I mean, it's mostly the costume, so, I mean, I guess it's cool. I think I it's pretty cool, honestly. Um, I'm, not, I'm not so keen on, like, like the altered, like, sports runner designing kind of things they do with the gloves and the, and the boots. At the same time, I always thought that, like, the original costume for the original Spider-Man trilogy, like, I always thought that, like, the, like the blue was way too dark. Yeah, and red and black. I actually like him when he's red and blue. So, I kind of like I kind of like the colors, and I like that in that in that poster shot we were talking about a second ago. You can see the wood shooters. I, I I I'm a little mixed on this, but I'm not overtly negative. I'm actually kind of looking forward to seeing how it's done in action. And the images they released for it look pretty good. I, I like the I like how the images are being done. So I'm I'm excited. I guess I'm sort of opposed to the shininess. The shininess of the of the like the texture of the fabric. Yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about. Okay, <laughs> I'm torn on the texture, and I'm sorry. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. What What other thoughts did you have, Bond? No, um, no, really, it's the texture. The black and white looks pretty good. Um, although that combination sort of went out with Michael Jordan a bit. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of preferred the blue. Um, but I'm indifferent. I'm totally pleased that it still sort of looks like a Spider-Man costume, which there was no guarantees that that was what we we're gonna get. Right. The only coloring changes that bother me are the hands. Yeah. Um, especially in the the publicity image they released today on theamazingspiderman.com. I should have snagged that domain whenever we started this show. Um, it was probably already reserved. Probably was. But and it probably hands, would have cost lots of money, but oh well. I don't mind the spiraling of the colors up his forearms. I just feel like his hands should be red. Um, yeah. The rest of the t- of the uh, coloring, I'm okay with. The direct frontal, um, maskless face down shot that was released a month or so back was obviously a post battle shot because there was all- there was all sorts of scratches on the front of the suit. The spider was barely discernible because of the destruction on the suit, and I felt like that was a really poor choice of a publicity photo to release first. Now that I've seen the whole suit, I'm actually really really digging it. I like how his eye lenses are reflective. That's a really big thing for me. I've always really enjoyed that in Spider-Man art. Mm-hmm. The only thing, and this is just a quibble because there's no solution, Spider-Man's suit is homemade. And you well, can't make a big screen feature with a suit that looks homemade. But I wish that you could. Have you seen the like sewing equipment that's in Aunt May's attic? <laughs> um, this is obviously some sort of like, you know rubberized thing going on that you couldn't make with, you know, yesterday's socks. But that's okay. I, I can deal with that. I can accept that. I really like the webbing on the face. Anyways, so yeah, that's our thoughts on the suit there, Mr. Ethan Smith. And thank you for listening to my other two shows. I'm getting kicked out of the Golden Age Superman show, and there is a special episode of that coming out very, very soon when we talk about Superman number one. So, uh, from Oliver Villar... Uh- to ASM3132. Hello, all. Enjoyed the latest episode, and it's getting more interesting now that you're covering the last year of Ditko's run. Scott did a great job on the show. During the discussion on issue 31, Scott mentions panel 7, page 12, the, the one of Spider-Man crashing on the wall. John Byrne did his version for that cover of that very issue of the 1985 Amazing Spider-Man 9-issue index series. For some reason, Ditko's Harry always reminded me of Maxwell Smart. Um, and I had to look this up. That, that's the Max, get smart. Maxwell Smart is, uh, yeah, he's. Uh, it was a sitcom, and it was basically like, well, Mr. Bond would know because it was a spoof of his yeah. franchise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah. The voice, the guy who did the voice, later went on to do Inspector Gadget. Oh, oh really? Get Smart was basically Inspector Gadget without the uh, robot body. Mm-hmm. Like he he played pretty much the same character, the bumbling spy that like somehow would not get killed. Yeah, the, the 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 shoe phone was big. Yeah. Love the shoe phone, and yeah. then you can like kill it with like throw it at somebody and oh wait that's Austin Powers never mind. 
Yeah, you're you're, you're confusing spy spoof franchises. I have um, I I have that uh that series somewhere. Um, I got a bunch of them years ago. That was where I got like some of the information. Like that was the index that said that Sally Green might possibly be Sally Avril. Okay. So you're saying it's not worth our time then? Um. <laughs> I think that's what he said at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I love those things. And <laughs> For issue number 32, I don't remember it being pointed out, but the cover reminded me of Action Comics number one. In this one, it's Spider-Man holding up metal stairs instead of an automobile while people run in terror. This will be the last time we would see the Ditko Dr. Octopus. In my opinion, Dr. Octopus was at his most threatening when rendered by Ditko. After that, I felt he just looked less threatening as rendered by other artists. I do believe it's the first time we see Peter totally lose it big time. No pun intended. <laughs> Something, <ugh. laughs> Something that J.M.D. Mateus would put to good use in his Spider-Man stories. It's totally true. <laughs> Looking forward to the next episode. Thanks for being so entertaining and informative at the same time, Oliver. Bond, are you reading the current Spider-Man books? Uh, not so much. Okay. Um, big Why time is the current is the name referred to as. The current status quo or current um, storyline going on in Spider-Man right now. Um, yeah, in San Diego, they said that it was just going to be like the first story arc, and that you know after that it was Amazing Spider-Man. But uh, what they said in San Diego is not matching what's being said by Diamond and Marvel. So it looks like another case of Brand New Day, where this is going to be known as Big Time for the foreseeable future, and even when the banner's gone. As far as issue 32's cover looking like Action Comics number one, I hadn't thought of that, but I do see it now. Um, it's actually pretty cool. I wonder if that was intentional. I don't think it was. I, I, think, I think it was a coincidence that um, there were two red and blue characters tearing up the stuff. Yeah. Do y'all, what do y'all think and about people? Deco? People are going to run away. You know, if, if you're tearing up stuff, people are going to run away. When I see someone tearing up stuff, I always run toward them. Is that weird? <laughs> to kill well, them. Maybe. That's why your insurance won't cover you anymore. <laughs> what do y'all feel about Ditko's Dr. Octopus as opposed to others? I like the Larson one because the Larson one was always doing like crazy stuff with his tentacles, even though it was totally unrealistic. But Ditko They're like really, really crazy. long. Yeah. I think the Ditko Dr. Octopus is sort of like most of his, most of his other villains. I don't think – I mean he, he, did, he designed him, so give credit where credit is due, but I don't think he left like an indelible stamp. Besides, but further than the actual design, in my opinion, I didn't I think, like the did the Ditko haircut on on Octopus. You didn't like the Ditko haircut? No, no, it was a little bit. I don't know, it was like a bowl cut or something. But I, this was this was actually something like like when I was a kid looking at early Ditko Doctor Octopus. Um, this like creeped me out because it was sort of like like I don't know like a mop top thing or something. I don't know. Sort of like the haircut the Hulk would have. Right. I kind of agree with what he's saying when you look at some of the Doctor Octopuses that came out over the first five or ten years after Ditko, like before issue 100 and during you know the, the second century of Spider-Man comics, um, like with the Aunt May story, Dr. Octopus just doesn't look as scary. He doesn't look as menacing. He looks like... I don't think he's ever really been... I don't think he's ever looked scary, to be honest. I mean, he's a dude with glasses, a bowl cut, and a, and a tubby cut with a bunch of tentacles. I mean, I can see how he would be imposing... And he can Tell that to Betty Brands. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected. Um, I don't know. It just sometimes looks like a, a green marshmallow with um, arms sticking out. And like, I'm picturing covers from like the '60s, the '50s and '60s of Amazing Spider-Man uh, in my head. And maybe I'm misremembering them, but I don't know. I do definitely like Dicko's Doctor Octopus, though. I like when he was smacking Spider-Man in, in, in ASN number three and threw yeah. him out of the window like a boss. Smack down. And Oliver Villar writes us again. Careful, Oliver. You have a quota. You can't go over. Uh, he is writing with an email called Episode 23 over ASM number 33 and 34. He says, Hi, guys. Hi, Oliver. Took a listen to the latest episode this morning. Scott said it best when he said, Listening to the podcast is like having the discussion right there in the same room, and you guys really do your homework. Aw. Thank you. Hmm. In issue number 33, I like the way Ditko drew the rising water in the first panel on page 7. It looked like it was forming tentacles all around Spider-Man. I do have to say that I think Spider-Man did the right thing by keeping himself busy for those two hours while he was awaiting the result of Aunt May's condition. Uh, he did have to raise money for the medical expenses. Peter probably felt that although he'd rather be staying by May's side, he had to do what he had to do during those two hours. 
I guess. Um, I can see both sides of the argument, to be honest, because like, he did have stuff to do. But at the same time, I think it would be more realistic if he just stayed there waiting for her condition. Because what if she died? <laughs> we would laugh and he would cry. I, I, I mean, I guess there's a certain point where that's sort and of she'd like... she'd be back two issues later. Right. It was an actress having radiation in her blood. I don't know. That really, <laughs> you're saying that just really underlines the crappiness of that story. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it was an actress because they actually do do that. <laughs> <laughs> In issue number 34, I remember seeing panel 3 of page 3 and thinking that next to Betty, Peter looked like a much younger kid, and Betty was like a Mrs. Robinson type. Like, hello, Mrs. Robinson? Or a different Mrs. Robinson? Was it Mrs. Are you talking about uh, the graduate? Is that, is that, Mrs. Is that Robinson, name? you're trying to seduce me, aren't you? What? You've never seen The Graduate? No. Oh, my. It's, um, oh, dear. Dude, John, that's it, your perfect movie. It, it's it's a very famous movie. and like, I know it is. It's one of those and, that I, and, I just never did see. And that's the line from it. Like, this um, this guy who, um, he's just graduated college, and his uh, a friend of his parents has invited him home, and she's, like, really, really putting on the moves on him. And he finally says to her, and th- it's a very, very famous line, Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. And then she laughs, and then he says, aren't you? And then, like, he feels like he's offended her, and they have an affair. But then, oh, what a twist. He falls in love with her daughter. Bum, bum, bum. What a twist? <laughs> yeah, the Betty Mrs. Robinson thing, that's... A lot of people still think that Betty is older than Peter. <laughs> Betty Brand as Mrs. Robinson is actually hilarious. <laughs> that's quite awesome. So, I haven't seen The Graduate and Sally April's dead. Anything else I'm missing? Empire State University. Still not real. <laughs> That's why they haven't returned your uh, acceptance letter. Right. It took a long time to find their mailing address online, too. But yeah, anyways... They're too, busy, they're too busy not existing. <laughs> my first time, still continuing Oliver's letter, my first time reading this was the Marvel Tales reprint from the early 80s. The Harry dialogue, the way it was read, it was very laugh-out-loud funny, and so were the jokes. Ditko's Harry always had that rat fink look about him. Yes, the Nails Hogan gang were non sequitur indeed. Yeah, they just came out of nowhere in the was that Craven? Yeah, that was Craven, the Craven issue. Yeah. Right. Notice panel one of page fifteen, that's the same pose that was used for the cover to issue number two hundred and fifty seven. But it was Puma instead of Craven and Spider Man in his alien costume. Okay, now I'm looking up covers again. I remember that. Yes. Wow. That's really cool. I love those or the, the, that that uh, first Puma story arc. Is that the first Puma story? Whenever he comes in two fifty something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Mary Jane uh, is like, I've known your secret. I've known it for years. I read that a super duper long time ago when I was a wee lad, so I don't remember the details. But Dr. I probably Peter shoved her in a closet for, for half an issue. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Jane, Mary Jane, I swear I'm not Spider Man. And then Black Cat comes in. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, he is. <laughs> it's true. It's all true. You guys mentioned the letter by Richard Peeney. As you may or may not know, Richard Peeney, along with his wife Wendy, created the series Elf Quest. I did not know that. Okay, you guys out there in listener land, I love it when you catch stuff about the letter writers that I did not know. We had a letter that we read on the air here from Carrie Burkett, and I had just happened to look him up online because he lived. Uh, in his e- in his letter he wrote to the Amazing Spider-Man, he was listed as living in a town that's not far from where I'm living now. And turns out he's still around. He's still on Facebook. And he wrote for DC and for Marvel in the late 70s and early 80s. A bunch of books yeah. that I haven't read. And he even wrote for Spider-Man for a couple of issues. So um, he's my friend now on Facebook. And, you know, if we make it to those issues, then, you know, maybe we can see if we can interview him about his work and stuff if, you know, we're all still alive at the time. So if you find out stuff about people that were uh, in the letters columns, definitely keep writing in. I love that stuff. Unless, unless he's, you know, Stephen Lacing. Oh, oh yeah, and lying to us about who they are. Yes, yeah. that's really Eric Larson's second cousin on his mother's side. <laughs> yeah, we should have that guy that whose letter was published in 650. Oh, yeah, there was a guy who's, uh, that we know. The one who went after John. <laughs> whose letter got published in Amazing Spider-Man 650. That was I. That was, was my it, letter. It, it was 650, right? Yes. Somewhere around there. The, the taxi cab fare in Superman comics post crisis was always six fifty no matter where you went got out of the cab six fifty. Uh, 
So Oliver concludes in the email that we've been reading for the last hour. Keep up the awesome work, guys. Looking forward to the next episode when you discuss the final Ditko appearance of the Molten Man and the emergence of a certain background character from the Midtown Business Executives Club. We're getting there. Wait. <laughs> Past it. All right, next one's from Steve Rogers. It says the Amazing Spider-Man Classics drinking game. Ooh. Hey guys, a drinking game was brought up in the most recent episode, so I thought I'd get the official game rolling with a few rules. Note, you must be of age. Drinking soft drinks, juices, milk, etc. Take a drink every time Donovan says a word in that rising voice he does, like, science! Awesome. Take a drink every time a reference is made to something that happened in an issue of Between the Panels or Issue series or book, like Untold Tales, Parallel Lives, etc. Take a drink for every hypnocoin! Take a drink for every reference to the goofy way the Silver Age used irony in order for you to live why must I die? <laughs> she loves my superhero ID, but she hates me, or vice versa. Well, that is a start so far. I'm we can sure. definitely get drunk off of that. What about, oh, yeah. the, what about the pet monkey? Oh, yeah, the darling pet monkey. He definitely deserves a drink. The darling pet monkey. He's, uh, oh, he's oh. waiting for somebody to buy him. And then Steve does have some other information in here about um, the, the various ages of comics with the Golden Age and Silver Age. But um, just in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and keep on going. Thank you very much for the email, Steve. And I do have my tequila here next to me uh, for the hypno coin and the science. So thank you. The next email is from Aiden Mohan. He writes an email called The Looter! Exclamation one, exclamation points times a thousand. Dear gang, guys, how can you think the looter is lackluster? And I swear to baby Jesus, I'm not being sarcastic. I think the looter is awesome. Really, he is freaking cool. I love him. He's like a 60s Batman original villain, but 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 badass. Really? <laughs> I, 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 I like the looter. I don't think he's I don't think he's a badass, but I, I have a soft spot for the guy. I honestly have never read a story where he was cool. That doesn't mean they're not out there. I just and I, I have so much Spider-Man that I have not read. So take that with a grain of salt, but. The stories I have read him in, well, in his introductory story, he's just a loon. And like Stan Lee makes it clear, this guy is a fruitcake. And um, anyways. Certified nuts. Yes. Anyway, John mentioned he'd like to hear my top 20 Spider-Man favorite stories. So here we go. Number 20, Killer Clone Kane. Is that the name of a story arc or is that just the name of the character? I think it's the name of an issue. It's a nickname for the character. Okay. 19, Craven's Last Hunt. 18, Amazing Spider-Man number 50, which I've read, so we'll be coming up on that soon. 17, Goblins at the Gate. I haven't read that one. When is that? That's uh, right before the reboot. It's uh, the only confrontation between Roger Kingsley and Norman Osborn. Yeah. Oh, nice. 16, Ditko Spidey Quits Trilogy. I'm going to go with that being 17, 18, and 19. I love that story. 15, The Night Gwen Stacy Died. It's rather low on the list. In my Spoiler opinion. alert. <laughs> she, she boinked her killer. Ah, oh, you had to go there, didn't you? So did she. <laughs> <laughs> Fourteen, the Tombstone Robbie saga. Is that Robbie Robertson? Is that Joe yes. Robertson or is that Young Robertson? No, it's, it's Robbie, not Randy. Oh, straight arrow. <laughs> I've not read that in the comics, but I'm sure it's awesome. Thirteen, Master Planner. That was good stuff. 12, Amazing Spider-Man number 192. Josh, you have that Marvel issues memorized. Which one is 192? That's, uh, quote-unquote, the last Spider Slayer story, uh, which turns out not to be the last Spider Slayer story. But that's uh, the death of Spencer Smythe and Jonah and uh, Spider-Man are, like, strapped to a bomb together. And it's also when Peter's friends decide to throw him a surprise party because his diploma is being mailed to him. And they get mad when he doesn't show up to his own surprise party that nobody told him about. Right. It's also the first um, time that we find out about Mary Jane's, like, family being dysfunctional through, like, one offhand thought balloon that's followed up on in the Stern and DeFalco run. Okay. And then he has Amazing Spider-Man Volume 2, number 31. Is that the first uh, JMS issue? It's a JMS issue, that's for sure. It had, the cover has Peter... Um, Pointing at a blackboard with a big old Spider-Man mask on it. Oh yeah, that's that's when he when he, when he like uh, fights a shooter in a high school, and at the very end he decides to become a high school teacher. 
that's, oh, the, yes. that, that, that's the second JMS one. The okay. first JMS one was 30. Okay, right. good deal. Amazing Spider-Man number 200. Death of the Burglar. Spectacular Spider-Man number 200. Death of Green Goblin. Death. Yeah, Death of the Best Friend. No, Green Goblin goes to Europe. Oh, yeah, that's right. He's not really dying. Yeah. Spectacular Spider-Man 189. Green Goblin throws a dinner party. Is that the end of the Child Within arc, or is that after the Child Within arc? It's after Child Within. Harry Osborn throws, like, a dinner party and kidnaps his family and stuff. And Molten Man's there, you know, because it's never a party with Oh, him. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. Number seven is Peter Parker, Spider-Man number 75. That's the death of the clone, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his name was Ben, you bastard! <laughs> no, Norman returns from Europe and... Uh, his name was Peter, you bastard. <laughs> Until he no more returns to die just again. Because that, that issue ends where, where you think he's dead, but actually he isn't. Okay. Yeah, and Betty Brandt is a complete in that issue, by the way. Uh, Flash, Tom, Flash Thompson's, like, all friendly to her. And, like, she's like, hmm. And he's like, oh, I guess I screwed up my relationship with her real bad. Yeah, Betty. Yeah, you know, because it was totally Flash's fault that you blew up his apartment. And never mind. <laughs> oh, Six is Captain Stacy's death. That's ASM 90. I'm surprised that Captain Stacy made it above Gwen Stacy. Because <laughs> he was a better character. <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> uh, five is Jean DeWolf's death. Does she die? No, just kidding. But I haven't read her death yet. <laughs> she dies uh, in like the first page of like that <laughs> like story arc. Right. Four is The Lost Years. That's the um, Ben Riley miniseries, right? Correct. Yeah. Annual 21 for The Wedding is number three. What wedding? You know, oh, that that's yes. sad. Exactly. <laughs> it, remember, the recon is retroactive. If you go buy a copy of Annual Twenty One right now, they will not be getting married in that book. Just so you know. <laughs> Issue number or number two is Amazing Spider Man number four hundred. The death, the death <laughs> of Aunt May. <laughs> I think you're a liar. <laughs> I'm a liar. Aunt May did not die in that. <laughs> and number one is Spectacular Spider Man two fifty. What is that one? Citizen Osborn. It's uh, when Norman Osborn comes back after uh, Peter Parker 75, and like this time he comes back as Norman Osborn, and he buys the Daily Bugle, and he turns the public against Spider-Man, and it, it's actually some really, really good stuff. And uh, the the cover's cool, because it has um, a John Romita Sr. cover, but then like when you open it up, it's a John Romita Jr. cover. Or I, I just got that backwards. It's Sr., and you open it... No, it's Jr., and you open it up, and it's Sr., I thought on the on, I thought the front cover like the actual cover was senior, but like on the back cover, you know, like the, like the gatehole cover, it would be a junior. Ah, it's, it's not like that. No, there's like some really good stuff in there, like like some powerful emotional stuff. Like at one point, Liz is like you know yelling at Mary Jane because Mary Jane's trying to get her to calm down, and then she's like, well, you don't have any children, so you don't know what it's like, and then like. Fog, because they just had the miscarriage, Foggy's like, hey, that was uncalled for, and she, like, slaps Foggy in the face. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a nice thing to do. And uh, he closes out by saying, thanks for listening, yo. See how hip I am, groovy dogs. I don't think you're allowed to talk like that. No, just kidding. <laughs> he says, I'd like to hear yours one of these days. From your compadre, Aiden M. Mohan. Thank you very much for writing, Aiden. Um, that's a cool list. I'm not sure what my top 20 would be. I would have to think about it, but um, we might we'll do that. We'll put it on sometime. Facebook one day. I could put it on Facebook. On the, uh, In fact, yeah, if, if any of you out there, go to our Facebook page. Put your top 20 uh, favorite Spider-Man stories or top 5 or top you know, 73, whichever number you feel like doing. And we can have some discussions on there. So we will get to more of your emails. And uh, I don't know if we'll do it next episode, but we'll definitely do it again soon. Uh, we're not going to wait so long between email uh, episodes again, at least not this time. But we do want to talk about the books that is the main feature for this episode. And starting off, we do have Amazing Spider-Man at number 41, released on July 7th, 1966, with a cover date of October. And giving us the skinny of what happened in this issue is our guest for the evening, Dr. Bond, Benton. <laughs> Well, uh, I think the cover for this issue is is, is pretty cool. Uh, I think a rhino. I don't know. The face is looking a little bit like Sloth from the Goonies, but otherwise, I think I think it's a pretty solid cover. He's got the hands going, kind of like the Ditko hands, but they're like like completely enormous and coming out at you. But they're you know disproportionately like 
probably a third larger than his actual like head. But I don't know. I thought it was pretty solid cover. What'd you think? Yeah, no, it's definitely action packed. Uh, Rhino's face looks really, really uh, like flat. Like his eyes are way too fall apart, and his far apart, and his nose is too big. <laughs> Broad. Yeah. So like I said, it looks like sloth from the Goonies. Yeah. <laughs> kind of smush. There you go. That's another movie that John hasn't seen. Are you serious? I have seen the Goonies. Oh my god. I've not seen it. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're like five, so I mean, yeah, that's tw- me. Twenty-two, awesome. right? I've, I saw it for the first time, um, uh, maybe two or three years ago. Somebody brought it into work. I need to show it to Lily. She hasn't seen it yet. I think it's a really, really good cover. I think it's an excellent introduction of the of the character. And Spider-Man looks so sad and pathetic behind him on the floor, um, saying, "Stop the camera! Stop pic- taking pictures! I don't want to look like this on the you know the cover of my own magazine." He's like, <laughs> right? It's like he's trying to stop Rhino from like knocking over those boulders, and he's like, "No, Rhino, don't! If you knock over those boulders, you may knock over those soon. boulders. Why must I build a wall?" <laughs> Sorry, that didn't exactly work, but there you go. <laughs> I, I saw a funny interview with Conway, by the way, where he talked about how he used to love to mock the old Stan Lee titles, and he did that during the first Clone Saga, where like one of the stories was called "Even If I Live, I Like I Live." I uh, I'll, I'll find the exact issue. If I lose, I, if I win, I lose. Like that. Some it's like if I live, I die or something. But uh, yeah, he he like was talking in an interview and you know said that it was in a tribute to Stan Lee. Oh yeah, here we go. Even if I live, I die, which is issue one forty nine. I mean, the title, I thought the book was all right, but the horns of the rhino, I, I don't know. Like, I don't think about the plural of horn on a rhino. It's like a, like a one-horn situation. But, but yeah, I thought the, the cover looked pretty good. Page one, I, I kind of like this. The, the, despite the extreme modesty for which we're so justly famous, we simply uh, have to tell you that this is one of the greatest achievements of – I thought it was like – like, I don't know. I thought it was like moderately amusing. Um, and I thought page one looked pretty solid. Didn't Stanley yeah. do that before? And he says, "We hate to brag, but right, that's like his only, thing. Yeah, only, only every issue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's his shtick. I mean, for some reason, though, it like always it always amuses me to see him do it. Um, but yeah, and on uh, starting with a story, yeah, uh, there's a, there's like a, a, a relatively long introductory series of panels. Where uh, Anna May and uh, May are chatting away, which is just like a lot of Mays, but yeah. And uh, of course, you know, uh, setting up, you know, um, I guess if we're playing the drinking game, like irony is being set up because she's concerned that if she would move out of the house, uh, that, that, that how could Peter ever take care of himself uh, without her? Um, <laughs> and I think we know exactly where that's going. Um, oh, and, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there are some. Uh, Really great anachronistic phrases that have just fallen out of popular usage. That are just you know, there's two or three good examples in this book, uh, but I guess the biggest one is uh, is when uh, Anna Mae Watson says that Peter is mostly staying because he uh, uh, likes to be molly coddled, and I I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> Coddle like yeah. a girl named Molly, I guess. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like pretty provocative i suspect it's not provocative at all uh but it's it sounds pretty interesting um well it's like whenever you're being handled with kid gloves what kind of gloves do you handle kids with i I just don't know mesh gloves of course yeah i don't use gloves it's all you know never mind yeah (laughs) there's no there's there's no good way to end that sentence (laughs) there's no way out (laughs) just quit while you're ahead well they're they're fundamentally filthy so i i recommend yeah, I think gloves with kids. Are, <laughs> oh, don't I know it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Daily basis, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess the other big thing is uh, uh, Peter announces uh, pretty early on in the book that he wants a motorcycle, which, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that that's like a, like an evolution of the character that's sort of, I guess, noteworthy. But he is he seems pretty intent on getting himself a motorcycle. Uh, and, of course, um, yeah, the only way he can get a loan for the motorcycle is if he has some kind of a credit reference. And... Um, who does he call? But his his uh, the most reliable credit reference he could think of would be Jameson um, at that <laughs> point. Um, and he jumps on board to it with a. Um, I believe he has a chortle about the idea of this that it will be you know like a further <laughs> way uh, to uh, have indentured servitude of Peter Parker. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that I would call my boss for a yeah. credit reference on a loan. That just seems weird to me. How many yeah. people does Peter know though? Yeah, that's true. I guess he can't call his parents. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Well, I mean, who's he gonna call? You know, Miss Mister Warren or you know yeah. Harry, the guy who we had like one good conversation with. <laughs> Well, I mean, he signs off on to it, but then on the next page, on three, there's just like, I, I know that, you know, the whole purpose of the character is, is just to, to bring out the Spidey hate, um, but this is like a really random jump to Spider-Man hatred. Um, even by, by Stan Lee standards, the jump is pretty random, uh, um, but he instantly uh, 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 goes into, a, of course, like a big heated rant about how much he hates Spider-Man. John Jameson is there. Is he called John anywhere in this book? Uh, I don't I think, think so. so. I, 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 actually, I that's a, f- a very good question. I don't know. I didn't I don't, really pay attention to the John count, but I don't know. I don't have my index with me. Dang it. Well, well, the index wouldn't the index wouldn't tell you unless like he wasn't called John before, and I'm pretty sure that he was called John in issue. Oh one. yeah, yeah, he was called John in issue one. But you're right, maybe it's not. Okay, while we're going through this, I'll be looking. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I was just wondering because I, I, I um. Page four, yeah. he's called John. Bottom yes. panel. Yeah. Okay, okay. Good call, good call. Because um, I, I, I didn't see it uh, right off the bat, and I was wondering if there's some, for whatever reason, they held back on it. But yeah, he's there. Um, and of course, there's an extended flashback to Spider Man saving him uh, at that point. Um, I have to wonder if John Romita, now that he has the regular job on the book, was given the stack of back issues to read. Mm-hmm. And just thought it'd be cool to spin off the story of John Jameson from number one, because I can't think of any reason, any inspiration of bringing this character back. Well, this is like um, almost an introduction to him as a character, because in issue one, he doesn't really like he's the MacGuffin of the story. But as a character, all he does is say, OK, Dad, I'll do you proud. We don't know anything about him like. Here is where we find out that, like, unlike his father, he actually supports Spider-Man. We don't get that from issue one. Like, he ha- he doesn't have an opinion of Spider-Man one way or the other. He doesn't do anything except, like, okay, Dad, I'll be in space. It's kind of like um, in Spider-Man 2 how he was sort of like Jameson's son, but he didn't get much personality from the guy. Where, yeah, where this, this one, you learn more about him. Of course, it is Spidey's salvation of him that gives him that opinion. Kind of moving on there uh, on to the next page. There's you know more extended flashbacks of the story, um, and uh, yeah, some continued Spider-Man rants from uh, Jameson. Uh, and they're pretty standard. Like at some point, I mean, like do you think like you could almost automate you know Jameson in the early Lee stuff? Yeah, like you wouldn't actually need to write it. I mean, you could almost like a Mad Lib. Really, um, with just you know random Spider-Man uh, <laughs> anger, uh, and I guess the big payoff on page four um, is that there is a strange thing that happened uh, on the last mission to space, and yeah, like eerie foreshadowing for where that's going to go. And of course, the payoff is that uh, he's been exposed to space spores, and just I, I kind of appreciate the fact. That it wasn't like anything radioactive because that seemed to be like like the default superhero generator is you know sort of like some kind of radiation of some sort. Right. The space spores. Yeah, the space spores. And I, really I will choose I will choose unknown alien cause over radioactivity any day of the sixties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least it was something like it. And um, the pictures of the space spores um, on page five, uh, the second panel on page five. Yeah, they, they don't look all that ominous, but yeah, and I'm also not really sure what a space spore is. Um, but you know, that's okay. It's magic. <laughs> you don't have to explain it. <laughs> space course, magic. Space magic. Uh, oh, he is being oh, tailed. Oh, it's fungus. <laughs> Sorry. It grows <laughs> all the way down to your toes. <laughs> <laughs> it's moldy. <laughs> okay, this is like a, a tangent. I I don't mean to get off off topic too far, but do you, did anybody see the movie The Right Stuff? I've heard of it. I know, I know the song. <laughs> oh yeah, the 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 NKOTB, right on. Um, but no, like there was, uh, I guess some incident where they were like glowing things floating in space. So there was some precedent for the idea of space spores, um, uh, based in some kind of reality. Um, but of course, naturally, his exposure to space spores means that he's being tailed by agents to ensure that nothing uh, happens uh, due to his exposure to space spores. Like if his voice starts sounding funny or hair starts growing in strange places. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, wait, that's the Man Wolf story. That's later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they got their bases covered when it does happen because there's you know two instant immediate victims right there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, and uh, then bottom of the panel of page five, we're introduced to Rhino. Um, he appears to be in the desert, and he is headed north. Uh, seemingly on foot, giving you the impression that he's going to sort of run, forest run, all the way up to New York. Uh, fortunately, they solved that later on, but uh, when I first saw that, I thought it was, you know, sort of like slightly ridiculous. Um, but yeah, he's headed north. Um, You're not the only one. But the space yeah. stores were the space stores were perfectly acceptable. Right. Yeah. 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 Wait, how um, did they solve it? Because I actually have a note about how he runs all the way to New York. No, he gets on a train. Does he? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. The, the, he comes. He uh, crashes uh, later on. Yeah, he, he crashes out of a boxcar uh, because I was actually thinking the exact same oh, thing. Oh, you're right, Charlie. There is someone moving inside the car. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Never yeah. mind. This is Which this produ- is what happens whenever I don't read the books. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it also produces another bit of anachronistic language that is awesome uh, when he gets out of the boxcar, which we'll come to later. <laughs> um, but it looks like some guys at the border in Arizona or something are uh, shooting at him, which is. Like eerily prescient to our current reality, so like that was yeah. Um, I noticed <laughs> that right away. So <laughs> and so they got it right, you know, like that that something like that was happening. But he uh, he goes through, um, you know, and continues onward and upward. Uh, and then on page seven, we have an immediate jump back uh, to New York. Yeah. And, no, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> And Peter is uh, uh, like seems to be pretty fixated on the motorcycle still. It's and a really he, awesome motorcycle. Yeah, it, it's it seems to be pretty great. And he suggests that uh, I'll bet uh, riding is almost as groovy as web swinging. And then I've nothing actually, happens because it cuts to a page later where people are watching the Rhino on TV. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, Does the Betty scene make you sad, Josh? Betty <laughs> makes me sad. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Betty Brand is not in this issue. <laughs> well, she, this is this is the greatest part ever. This is the end. She's still on the west. It's not the end. <laughs> Read the Wolfman Run. <laughs> it, it, it is the end until like ten years later. Oh, and boy, when part two is a doozy. That's what she said. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but since it ties in with the Wolfman story, oh, I do. The reunion, I guess, is, is, is fairly awkward. Um, suggestions, you know, buying a cup of tea or have you read any good books lately? Um, and I think that he, he, he describes the whole thing as, as nothingsville. Yeah, and, and, and I thought the art was pretty good because it, he actually, they actually did a pretty good job of drawing subcon- like, 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 uh, uh, self-conscious Peter, I thought, looked pretty sharp there. Uh, fortunately, yeah, fortunately to break up the, uh, the awkward reunion, uh, Peter sees that Rhino is coming to New York. Ned Lee breaks up the reunion. Yeah, yeah. Not in a rhino costume, but that would have been awesome. <laughs> Ned <laughs> Leeds great. The rhino. Ben Leeds is the rhino would have would have ruled. Um, yeah, but they're uh, uh, again they're concerned that he's headed towards New York on foot, which you know is only slightly uh, 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 more nonsensical than the idea of him running all the way up there. But yeah, only um, as usual on a page. Uh, uh, nine, the kids are debating um, about uh, who's stronger, Rhino versus Spider-Man. And uh, at that particular moment, we move to uh, Peter and uh, Jameson and Son. And, of course, yeah, Peter wants to go up and say hello. And uh, I know that you guys like to, to point out uh, a Silver Age irony. Um, and some of it, some really good ones coming right here. It's... Um, you're right. Uh, I'm proud. He's a real hero, not like that phony fraud Spider-Man. And of course, he's talking to Peter in that particular moment. So. Dun dun dun. Yeah. Which is why Peter is smiling on the next panel. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, Jonah, you're stupid. <laughs> yeah. It, it, this is like again. It's almost like rote at this point. You know, you can almost yeah. Um, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get exactly that scene. Um, yeah, but um, it's there um, and. 
<laughs> What's next? The scene about Aunt May thinking that Peter's fragile. <laughs> exactly. You're right on. Like it is. It is uh, just fire up the combine. There is a harvest of Silver Age irony coming because on the next page, <laughs> Peter um, is uh, very concerned about moving out from Aunt May because she's entirely too fragile. Which, yeah, like that irony was set up at the beginning of the of this book. Peter should be very concerned about Aunt May doing his laundry and hanging up his clothes in yeah. the closet where there is a Spider-Man costume right there in front of God and everybody. Retconned um, in Untold Tales that uh, there was a secret compartment in his closet that the Spider-Man costume was in. I love it when my 100-year-old house all of a sudden now has a secret compartment. And um, a tre- and, tre- and buried treasure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Marv Wolfman, we are coming for you. It will take 10 years to get there, but we are coming. <laughs> Fortunately, we jumped to a train yard soon thereafter. So uh, Rhino has taken the train to New York, um, and, he, and he smashes out of the train, um, making the whole story much more plausible. Uh, we get some more awesome language because the cops suggest that uh, uh, the noise coming from the car, uh, they say, hey, that's no ordinary bindle stiff, which is also just a great word. Um, and what the hell is a Bindle stiff. A bindle was like the thing that hobos use with, with the stick with like the handkerchief on it. So I guess that a stiff would be like a regular stiff. So I guess they're thinking that kind of thing that people who hitch hitch uh, hitchhike on trains are those kind of guys. I guess that they were referring. No, to. you're exactly right. A bindle stiff would be a tramp or a hobo, i.e., someone who uses a bindle. Yeah, and I don't know. I like. I think I'll make it my mission, you know, to insult somebody. I'm going to call them a molly coddled bindle stiff, which. <laughs> Which is wow. the whole purpose. Yeah, that'd be just great. No need for such language on this podcast. You Indeed. might get beat up there, Bon, if you if you did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rhino smashes out of the uh, the car, and uh, on the next page, Spider Man decides, of course, that he's going to have to find him because he knows that he's in New York and it's time for action. And Rhino is there to take Lieutenant Colonel Jameson, um, who was called John. I'm glad you confirmed that in this issue. And continuing on, there's uh, on page 12, like, I thought that was a pretty good, like, uh, uh, top panel on page 12 um, as he's smashing through. Yeah, Jameson looks pretty uh, uh, pretty frightened, and there's, I don't know, it's a pretty good action panel, I thought. And uh, Jameson Lino, looks like he's screaming like a girl. Yeah, which is perfect. Yeah, it, it looks really sharp uh, in the action of Rhino. Rhino actually looks sort of threatening. Um, I would say he's one of those villains that uh, ultimately becomes much more of a comic figure, um, like like easy punchline. But he actually looks like really menacing several times in this te- in this book, which I thought was good. Rhino uh, captures John, kind of bringing that story together, and Spider Man, of course, follows. On thirteen, uh, we have a fight with a uh, typical round of wisecracks uh, from Spider Man. Yeah, I like some 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 good stuff. What do you guys like on this page? I like the fact that I mean. Later on, he's going to be dumbed down as a person, and he never does manage to connect. But the Rhino has the potential to be one of the deadliest guys that Spider-Man ever fights. Yeah. All he does is try to frickin' gore you. That's his weapon. His weapon is to tear out your guts with the horn on his head. And, and the, that's the what he tries games, to he's do. Actually, he's actually pretty formidable. Well, well, he's, once you know how to be, how to be, he's not that hard, but like... You really want to get out of his way in the video games, like um, an Ultimate Spider-Man, yeah. even like a PlayStation Spider-Man game. Like you, you don't want to get hit by that. So, well, in the, in the PlayStation Spider-Man game, that's like the epitome of his dumbing down. Yeah, you just oh. jump out of the way, he smashes into the wall, um, and you do that two or three times on the NeverSoft game, like the first uh, PlayStation Spider-Man game. But he's always like the first boss on any Spider-Man game. Like, the, yeah, the, I, I, I actually on, my, on the Ultimate Spider-Man game, I only played up to beating the Rhino. And that took me so long to do. He's evil. In the mm-hmm. game, but in the places oh, one, the he's, he, he like throws cars there. Yeah. Uh, his motivation, of course, is revealed as well in the third panel on 14. Uh, that uh, there are other countries who will pay me a fortune for delivering him, for delivering John Jameson. And some of the, the wisecracks involve questions about the itchiness of Rhino's costume, which... I think is like a relevant question, and you could you could have gone even further with that. I guess in the 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 time period that he, that that they're writing, you know, like questions of 
Uh, was there ever a retcon how he peed in the thing? I mean, I'm sorry, but like this, this totally did occur to me when he was talking about the Yeah, engineer. there's like a special pouch or something. Uh-huh. Seriously, that has not been addressed, has it? There's like a compartment, yeah. I, I, I know that, that that this has come up before. Okay. Uh, I thought that he couldn't I mean, get out of that costume. Maybe, maybe he was using with Scorpion, but I thought that like he was stuck in that thing. Right, yeah, but um, he gets stuck in it. I don't think he's. I don't think he's always stuck in it. I know that in the like nineteen ninety, nineteen ninety one time frame, uh, there's a big thing with the deadly foes of Spider Man and getting the costume off. That's like a there's big like uh, it's kind of like footy pajamas. There's a little hole somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, well, look at like like Spider Man starting to him is that is that costume itch? I mean, look at this guy. We gotta address how ridiculous this costume. I, I think this is like. Ramita's first new character that he's that he's been drawing, and he's a giant, he looks like a Power Ranger because he has the whole head on his head, on his helmet, and you see the face. It's it, I find it hilarious. You remember that scene in the the movie A Christmas Story where he comes out as like a uh, in that pink outfit, the atrocious god awful bunny outfit. Yeah, the bunny outfit. You look like a deranged Easter bunny. Yeah, it, it, I guess it kind of goes like that direction too. Uh, I think I, I'm still just kind of like happy with the issue because like Rhino has become such a such a, a comic foil that to see him actually legitimately threatening is kind of refreshing. And there's a little bit of origin humor, humor that I thought was pretty good. Like I think you know Stanley is is if anything self-aware. I mean like that's that's pretty obvious. But when uh, Spider-Man asks, I wonder if he was bitten by a radioactive Sherman tank. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's not like Comedy Central stuff, but at the same time, I mean, he at least is acknowledging that, you know, when in doubt, create radioactive X thing, have radioactive X thing bite person, and then, you know, you've got yourself uh, a character. Especially Uh, if you're doing something completely unrelated, whenever the radioactive thing happens, that way the two unrelated things can merge and become your power. Right, yeah. Especially then, yes. (laughs) You could probably fill a whole show just talking about how many times that's happened. There's a little bit of origin humor there that I thought was nice. Going on to uh, 15, some more good. Like I thought that this this uh, the the top panel was pretty good. It's the panels are getting like bigger progressively as as the book continues, and I thought this one was a really good like action telling the story sort of panel, um, and I thought it looked sharp as Rhino crashes the phone booth. There is another uh, just fantastic uh, insult of string bean, which I, I, I had actually heard that one before, but I think it should make a comeback um, as far as insults go. Um, on Urban yeah. Dictionary? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll get you I'm off I'm going to go onto per- Facebook right now, and the first friend who I see, I'm going to call a string bean. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, friend. You don't do it. I, I'm totally pulling at the Molly Coddling Bindle stiff on somebody later. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, String Bean is just pure epic win. And going on to the next page, 16, yeah, there's a pretty good plan. He's just going to keep dodging him until he tires out. Um, and the plan, kind of, you know, the, the germination of the plan occurs in his mind at that moment. Uh, Spidey actually mocks his lack of introspection um, because, you know, typically, and I think this is actually sort of clever too. I mean, it's it's like a standard joke that, that – that all your villains will do a fair amount of monologuing, um, and it's not so much happening in this case. Um, and I thought that was pretty funny. Continuing on, the fight consists of a lot of dodging, and there's more dodging to come. And Spidey's statement that he's in it for the sound effects I thought was pretty good, too. Um, yeah. Uh, naturally, uh, the fight culminates with the exhausted rhino collapsing, Jameson appearing and immediately suggesting that they should capture Spider-Man. Um, of course. Per usual. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, yeah, it's almost like 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 mandatory um, that he says that immediately. Rhino is arrested, and Jameson has perhaps the most insightful comment in the entire issue uh, when he states, uh, uh, "But what happens uh, when he comes to? Might he crash right through the walls?" Which I think probably should have been brought up when they when they arrested Rhino and put him in a in a jail cell. But yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll worry about that later. We'll worry about that later, yeah? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, you know? Um, Just very soon. <laughs> because of yeah, this. Yeah, there's like a, a, not a lot of planning there, but at least someone acknowledges it, which is which I think is a good sign. Um, <laughs> and, um, they should just not let him wake up. Just keep him sedated for the rest of his life. 
That would actually be pretty great. Um, yeah, just to kind of keep him in like a comatose rhino state, um, that would be great. <laughs> They'll put him in a habitat full of other rhinos. <laughs> and they'll be like, now he can run free. <laughs> give, give him a female rhino to snuggle up with. <laughs> this is all I ever wanted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was just misunderstood this whole time. And then you find out later that the female rhino is Russian. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. Um, well, because the rhino is Russian, right? Yeah. Aless- yeah. Aless- Aless- yeah. Yeah. I love animated series, Rhino. <laughs> No, see, the great thing about these Russian guys is that this is the 1960s, so if they were ever going to be Russian, this is when they should be Russian, because it's the 1960s. But no, you don't find out that these guys are Russian until the Cold War is over. All that wonderful uh, uh, political intrigue and, you know, political correctness that, there, that, that most certainly would have happened, it's all gone now. Well, the, the Red Ghost was Russian for sure. No, I was talking about, like, Craven and the Chameleon and... In the Rhino, they're all Russian, and we don't find it out until like seventy-five years later. Yeah, probably Dicko, Dicko probably would have made it a lot more, um, more, more hate-filled. <laughs> I'm not even going to hide that word. Yeah, political correctness wasn't really a thing. Yeah, no, I, don't, I have no idea why they didn't do that in this issue. And they could have, like, you know, had him, you know, the standard thing of just switch your W's and your V's, um, and, and then right away you've got yourself an authentic-sounding Russian. Um, but, right around the KG beast, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And continue with uh, more Spidey hate, necessarily. And uh, uh, Jameson, you know, still is having none of it, even though his son recognizes that Spider-Man is a hero who saved everybody. Uh, we got Peter driving a motorcycle. And uh, helmet laws, not a thing in the 60s. And that's, that's yeah, that, that just adds to the whole effect, I think. Well, his and, spider sense will help him. Yeah, he's, he probably actually wouldn't need... A helmet at that point, but yeah. They get in trouble for that in the letters column later. They do? Yeah. Oh, man, I don't have a copy of the letters column. Well, when, you, when he starts wearing a helmet, it's because an issue or two earlier someone griped. Really? Yeah. God, the fun police were out even then. Like, I thought that everybody was just... <laughs> yeah, I think that Ramita didn't like drawing him with the helmet because, like, two or three issues later, he sells the bike. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, no, I really that's that totally stuns me. I didn't know that there was a, a letter in the letter column about that. Uh, I thought this was just the era of you know people with non flame retardant sleepwear smoking away, riding without helmets on dangerous playground equipment. But I guess there was some some people then that were concerned. Gwen, though, of course, is intrigued by this, which is a uh, I guess an important kind of like development in where uh, where that story is going to go. And uh, yeah, she's really feeling the Peter Parker love. And, of course, May is concerned about Peter's sinuses uh, on the bike, which was also, I thought. <laughs> Not his exposed skull. <laughs> no. Or limbs. If a car crashes into him, he'll catch a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to get any germs from that fender that just penetrated your face. You know, when, when I oh, my God, Peter's old. bleeding. He can catch an infection. When I'm reading these old issues where Peter has a motorcycle, like, because of the era... All I think of is like the Happy Days theme song with that, that shot of Fonzie driving down the street. Saturday, what a day, grooving all week with you. Yeah, no, like that totally hits it. Yeah, because like the the this is totally a Fonzie motorcycle that he's got. Yeah, and it completely looks and like the, that. It's, it's not a Harley Davidson, right? Did y'all see the musical version of Little Shop of Horrors? <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve to the, uh, yeah, Martin. I own the soundtrack. Yeah. Steve Martin's on the motorcycle, and yep. he doesn't wear a helmet either, but then again, he loves pain, so... Yeah. <laughs> no, the motorcycle the is... best things about, was younger, about that movie, yeah. <laughs> no, it's... it's uh, yeah, May is, again, totally concerned about the sinuses uh, on the bike. Uh, and, of course, yeah, like, May also wants to try to talk the cool kid lingo, and she refers to the bike as a uh, pussy willow. Uh, and uh, Peter corrects her and uh, uh, says uh, pussycat is the preferred term. But he, he, I don't know, I think he found it endearing, and he refers to May as a pussy willow, which this is this is a family podcast, but I don't know. There was it's a- not a family <laughs> podcast. <laughs> well, hello, Aiden, and hello, um, Ethan, and Smith. all of our other 12-year-olds in the audience. It's just that that, that it's not a family just, podcast. Says the guy who has his daughter on every four episodes. <laughs> yeah, but she lives with me, so I mean, think of the things she's exposed to. John has to edit out all, most of the things she says anyway. <laughs> she's actually growing up surprisingly gets, innocent acting, you know, for for the environment in which she lives. Aww. 
I should stop talking. Someone's going to call CPS. <laughs> <laughs> the, just the, the P word appears a lot on this page. And yeah, like maybe it's just my modern sensibility, but it just seems sort of creepy that it happens well, so it frequently with me right there. It doesn't make much sense, though, if you were, even if you reply to this day center and say, that looks like a real blank. No, no, you mean a real blank, Willow. No, a blank cat. Like, when you're describing a motorcycle like that, it, it makes zero sense. You're just either really, really kinky and freaky or just an idiot. And I, it's not like the word wasn't being used back then. When Ian Fleming wrote Octopussy, he knew exactly what he was doing with that title. And the the word was there, and yet Pussycat was still something people called each other in the 60s. And it's just weird because you can't say Pussycat right now. And, um, and when, when Goldfinger was coming out, um, in some countries they – or I, I think this is true. In some countries they, they edited her name to Kitty Galore. So – and the and because they bought, the censors were bothering the writer, the script of the, the film for Sean Connery to say the word um, pussy over and over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> what she ends up doing in the movie? She's like, oh, poor It's a pretty awesome shot in comedy. My grandmother right used to call me a pussy cat when when I was little. So is that before she took you to back to the back bedroom? Sorry, never mind. For best memory. Yeah, that's what John was. <laughs> no. <the shot> okay. <laughs> I should not say some of the things that I say. I'll just like you know pretend that I don't say them. I, I, th- I think Lily Lily wants your attention, John. She's right behind you, listening to everything. <laughs> right. So yes, there's definitely a lot of uh, wow. I'm really gonna. There's, there's, there's definitely a lot of pussy in this topic. This, this all might be cut in out, the Marvel though. Tales version. It's in the Marvel Tales version. It's it, it, they're like, wow, that thing is really pimping. Well, of course, Betty Brant came back. Of course, there's a lot of. Oh God. <laughs> No, she she she's she's still on the she's still in the Midwest or wherever she was. She uh, she she hasn't been seen since. So why are you sad about her coming back here? I mean, we've had so much fun with Betty Brant. You've never spurned her before. She's going to feel in love. It's revenge of the sin. She's going to ruin everything. I just know it. <laughs> Didn't she say that she was on a coast in this issue? Did she? Something. Like that. I yeah. think she did. All I know I is was... that Peter's an idiot in this issue because she's like, yeah, I just got here a few minutes ago. And then Peter's like, huh, she hasn't even given me her new address yet. She really must not care. Well, of course she hasn't given you her new address. She only got into town like three minutes ago. Besides, <laughs> she's probably staying the night at Ned's. And the next night, and the next night, and the next night. Did you have a nice time on the coast? Yeah. yeah. So she was – wait, New York is the coast. Oh, my God. New York is a coast. Oh, this my is God. Was... Yeah. I just realized what really happened. Uh oh. Okay. Turn that on, Josh. Okay. No, my my whole thought about like her, like you know, she doesn't have an address because she just got back in the town. Ned was supposed to pick her up, and she was gonna stay at his place, but she runs in the Peter. That's why she feels so awkward, because like, oh gosh, Ned is supposed to meet me here any sick. So then like Ned me, you know, follows them into the coffee shop and then plays it off like, oh, Betty, nice to see you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Actually, I love that. I, that is canon for me now. Wow. I, I, I condescending Jameson. Like, no, that 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 to me is what happened. Con- she totally con- – yeah, I'm coming back in the town. Yeah, well, where, where was she going to stay? <laughs> the, uh, the issue wraps up with the big tease that uh, Anime says that uh, they ought to have dinner with uh, her niece, Mary Jane, um, I guess the, uh, the next Sunday. Uh, I think even then they recognize this was a pretty big introduction because yeah the next issue prominently says you're about to meet uh, Mary Jane in a pretty big font at the end and these were the, all like all the stuff for the issue I, th- I thought it was like 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 it was pretty entertaining like there's you know there's there's no finality uh, to the battle um, I think the series is becoming more episodic at this point um, yeah yeah what do you guys think about it about the issue as a whole the issue as yeah. a whole I I actually thought it was a little bit light. There, there wasn't a. I mean, there were little tidbits of supporting cast, but not a whole lot of supporting cast. And after not having a whole lot of supporting cast in thirty nine and forty, I was. I'm, I'm kind of beginning to wonder. Well, I guess thirty nine we did. He gets captured at the end. We didn't have much of the cast in forty. 40 we don't have there much. was no. There was no supporting cast really. Yeah. Well, there was a page of Betty Brand, but that was it. So I'm actually wondering why they're taking so much of a break from Harry and Gwen and Peter being on campus. Sure, he gets a new bike, which is cool for Peter, 
But uh, as far as stuff that happened in this issue that has an impact on the ongoing, you know, subplots, there wasn't a whole lot. Are you kidding? This sets up Aunt May moving out, and Peter, like, has his thirst thoughts, hmm, maybe I should move out too. This sets up the whole sand spore thing, a space spores thing, excuse me, which is followed up next issue. Like, there, there are some threads that they start leaving here. He buys the motorcycle. Gwen and Peter. Um, I Betty, guess I just Betty missed- Brandt. I guess um, I just missed Harry. Betty Brant comes back. Yeah. I, I think mean, this that, um, is like almost the beginning of when it becomes more episodic, actually. I think this is where the, the era in, in Spider-Man comics, where a lot of like, the, the, the social hijinks really, really ramped up. Like, this this Rhino battle is really forgettable for me. Like, honestly, the, the, when I think of, like, when the Rhino first appeared, I think of, like, his next appearance where Spider-Man uses the web fluid to melt his costume off. This, like, really, all I thought about here was uh, him meeting Betty again and him meeting Gwen at the end and calling her a pin-up and all that stuff. I mean, I, I thought it was an interesting issue, but I really – it was one of those issues where, again, I just cared more about the social the social stuff than Spider-Man's fighting. Thank you, Bond, for the uh, for the recap because this is uh, – this is – I guess you're right. I guess there's a lot of stuff that gets set up here that's played off on later. And I, as soon as you started listing off all those things, I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that, that, and that. But the, I, the, aside from Betty showing up, I didn't feel like any of our past subplots were being returned to in this point. Uh, Josh is going to hate me. Josh is going to hate me, honestly. Oh. What, the, the, this scene uh, where Betty comes back and like Peter thinks that there's nothing there. <laughs> I don't know what. To this day, that, that makes me sad. <laughs> like, I don't know. That, 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 that yes. Like, <laughs> Poor Peter. He's not going to be in that relationship anymore where, you know, where he has to feel guilty for, you know, like having a circus ticket fall out of his jacket. <laughs> I really regret it, this. I don't know. It's just a, I, it, it's either re- relatable because, you know, I've had that happen to me myself or it's just that, like, the way it's written, I, I coming from like the scenes and stuff like that and it, it, it feels kind of I, I feel kind of sorry for just like the, just like that relationship coming to an end that way I, it's kind of a shame that it had to end like that kind of like nonchalantly well or maybe fizzle. yeah but I, what do I know I sometimes always in, because like it's been established like that I never got over Peter based on like various stories particularly what happened after she got married and the way that her engagement started. So my interpretation of that scene was uh, because it's been established from like Marvel men's run and other runs that Betty still had a thing for Peter forevermore. So that I guess Betty felt awkward in the scene, but for different reasons than Peter did. My interpretation was that he felt awkward because he didn't have anything to say to her. And she felt awkward because she didn't know what to say here. She was like, you know, back with Peter again and, she was too shy and nervous to figure out what to say, and Peter just, in his self-absorbed kind of way, figured, oh, yeah, she must be feeling the same way that I'm feeling. Hmm, yeah, I was, I was thinking about that when, when Bond hit it in his recap, like, you know, because she totally um, put the movie, abandons her husband in another country, as Betty Brandt is often want to do. So, like, yeah, I, I think you're right that she probably still has something towards him, but he's like, it's nothingsville. So that's interesting to think of. And she's like, oh, there's so much I want to say. Like, she has her own, like, you know, romance. Like, I'd really be interested in, like, what's going on in Ned Leeds and Betty Brand's thought balloons. But it'll probably be something like, oh, God, this is awkward. Ned was supposed to pick me up and take me back to his his place. (laughs) What am I going to (laughs) do? But yeah, Peter's an Peter's an idiot. Of course, she can't give you her new address because, A, she's shacking up with Ned. B, uh, she just got back in the town minutes ago. But You say Peter's an idiot that Betty... Because Betty doesn't have an address yet. Well, logically, though, do you think she would come back yeah. into town without knowing where she's going to stay? Well, either she gets a hotel or she's going to stay with a friend. for. But, like, she literally just got in the town. Like, I don't think that she's already, like, you know, from the phone, rented an apartment and, like, you know, is about to move in there. See, I, I, I do kind of see what Donovan's saying, though. Like, if she's coming back to New York and she's getting off the train, theoretically, she's already set up accommodations, whether that be, you know the backseat of Ned's car or a motel somewhere or, you know, and Jameson's house. I don't know, but... Oh my gosh, that would be fan fiction. <laughs> Mr. Jameson, can I stay at your house? You left the bugle, you left my files, and you broke my heart? 
Miss Betty Brant, I think you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Miss Brant, can you bring some pants in here, please? <laughs> Again! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want this written now. Okay, so we, we, we've talked about before um, the whole retcon about how it turned out that Mary Jane did not live with Aunt Anna, even though, like, you get the impression that she did from all this stuff. It was revealed in Parallel Lives that, like... Less than a week before the Sunday when they were going to have that dinner is when Mary Jane came to town to stay with Anna for a few days before getting her own apartment. Mm-hmm. The way that Anna's talking here, she's like, well, now that Mary Jane's finally moved out and the house is so lonely, you should move in. It's like, wow, Mary Jane crashed at your place for like a few days. I mean, I, I know that it's a retcon and it's kind of like Parallel Lives' fault and not Stan Lee's fault, but it just, you know, Stan Lee, makes why the scene you see read the in a more interesting light. Yeah, yeah, looking back at that whole retcon about how Mary Jane did not live there just uh, doesn't really work too well. With, no, because uh, there's there so stories. many references to her, and then here it says she's moving out, so it's implied that she's been there the whole time, and the, the retcon doesn't work. Yeah, I think that like this issue, Jonah was kind of a parody of himself, and I know that's pot kettle black, but... um, That you are every, a parody of yourself? No, I think Jonah was... Yeah, <laughs> Oh, no. Well, I'm saying that like it, it's probably the wrong phrase. I'm saying that like I know it's it's hard to see Jonah. Every scene he's in, almost he's like yelling about Spider-Man, almost for almost for completely no reason. Like 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 Bond said, he says that reminds me. I forgot to hate Spider-Man today, and then he goes on and on for pages about Spider-Man, completely un- unprovoked. And it's like that's I thought I found that a little annoying. <laughs> No, you're right. It is almost parody status. He is he is very over the top in his spider bashing this time. It's, it's the same with with He's been May at the very beginning. He's been <laughs> flanderized. You want to explain the term? Yeah, go to go to TV tropes, flanderization. <laughs> okay, okay uh, it's, it's basically yeah, it's, like when over time, like a character becomes more and more a caricature of themselves. Like for example, and the reason why it's called flanderization is because uh, Ned Flanders and like the old like Simpsons episodes, he was just like you know. Uh, happy-go-lucky guy who was supposed to be, you know, a good neighbor, and one of the small qualities about him was he just happened to be Christian, and then more and more he he became a caricature, a caricature until, like, he became, like, super Christian and, like, overly religious and etc. So, like, like the point is, like, Jonah can't get, Jonah can't breathe two breaths without yelling about Spider-Man with a cigar in his mouth. Kind of like how on the new Scooby-Doo show, like, in the old ones, Fred used to always, like, set up traps, and people joked, huh, Fred sure likes traps. In the new Scooby-Doo show, like, Fred is literally obsessed with traps, where it's the only thing that he'll talk about. My daughter is big into the, the new Scooby-Doo, and I therefore, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. No, I therefore have to watch a lot of it, and as I watch it, I actually kind of think it's not very good, because um, it's self-aware. No, it's not. No, it's totally not, yeah. I mean, it's not like Scrappy Doo bad, but I mean, like it's it's not good. Um, and it's a, like a, at a point there's self awareness, and I and I kind of like at this point in the run, I'm getting like like the sense that Jameson is to that point as well, where they basically know that he's he's it, yeah like he's no there's no motivation to this guy anymore. You don't you don't take him seriously. Um, he really just exists to hate Spider Man, and that's about it at this point. Did your daughter make you watch the episode where she, where Scooby accuses Shaggy of cheating on him with Velma? No. That was the worst. <laughs> and our first. <laughs> there's, also scenes don't need to happen. Some, there's also scenes in this and, and like the next issue we're going to cover where people somehow assume other characters' feelings to kind of ex- explicate and expose it for the reader. Like when James, where John Jameson is giving the flashback for ASM number one. Somehow he knows Spider-Man's thought process, and he continues it into um, his narration. There's, there's one there's one instance where his narration matches Spider-Man's dialogue, and the way he narrates it, he, he knows it's, that, that it's a match. It's very weird. I'm trying to find it. Yeah. Well, it's funny you mention that because, uh, okay, here's here's your Untold Tales reference. Everyone, take your shot if you're playing the <laughs> drinking game at home. Because uh, there was an issue of Untold Tales that takes place between this and issue one of Amazing, where like Jameson comes back. All the Untold Tales like, issues recruits. take place between this and issue one of Amazing. Right, but I mean, the point I was making, I guess, is that it was between <laughs> two Jameson appearances. And uh, he wants to recruit Spider-Man into the space program, and uh, 
like he, that. He, he gives a character profile of Spider-Man to his dad, and like he's completely off the mark. He's like, well, you know, <laughs> Spider-Man is always joking around, and he's always, you know, very, very jovial. He's probably, you know, really, really popular among his friends. And then it cuts to a scene of like Flash Thompson, like, hey, Peter, want to ride to school? Why, sure, Flash. Then take the bus, and he drives away. And then it keeps on cutting back to Jameson saying, and, you know, the way that he always is with his powers, he probably shows them off. Well, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that he's an athlete in his everyday life. He couldn't keep those powers to himself. And then it's a scene of him, like, jumping on a tree to, like, teach Flash a lesson, but then deciding that he can't because, you know, fragile or something. Fragile or something. So, Motorcycle. <clears throat> Do you all think that that is the most exciting new purchase that PD has ever made? You betcha! I mean, no. And well, I mean, what else has he purchased? I don't know. It's just what um, what Stanley says in the opening bubble. He says that you will see the most exciting new purchase that PD ever made, and you will see Spidey fight the most fearsome villain of all. If this was like 15 issues ago, like he'd be pulling up to the bugle, and Betty would be like, "Oh, Peter, you're probably going to use that motorcycle to impress other girls." <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, he totally. That's exactly what would happen. Yeah. And there'd be an entire issue of that. Well, don't or he'd worry. Be like, he'd, he'd, be, he'd give Liz Allen a ride to school on it, and Flash Thompson would be, like, washing from the bushes, being like, oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> come to this. No, no, like, like, Flash Thompson from the bushes, like, and, like, it just, it just pans up to him, like, like rising from the bushes, like, as if you didn't know it was him. I really like the uh, caption, the opening caption on the first page. Most superhero thrillers open with contrived action in order to hook you. But we know you'll hang around, and to prove our faith in you, let's visit Aunt May. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's a, that's a pretty big test of faith. <laughs> and it's just like, wow, we know this is your least favorite part of the story, so we're just going to do it right up front just to see if you'll stay. <laughs> and please stay. And it's really, it's really, really annoying. Like, we talked about how Jameson's been flanderized. Aunt May, God. Every time she says frail and fragile, I want to do something horrible to my comic book. <laughs> because she says it over like Peter's so frail and fragile. Look at him, the college student. I mean, I okay, I know it's her gimmick, but man, it's like not being sold very well. And then Anna Watts is like, but May, he's almost twenty. He's going to college. He's earning a living. And I just want to so like, just wanna high five her. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we're going by the by the idea that Anna Watts and Peter Parker have a thing going in the background, she's like, but he's so manly. But um, yeah, I, I, you know that he, he's almost twenty. He's so he's nineteen by this point. Goblin said in the last issue that he was, uh, or two issues ago, he was nineteen or twenty. Boy, during those forty-eight hours that Mary Jane was living with me, I did some pretty good parenting. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you, you should take my advice. The the woman who does not have a teenager living with her full time. I love um, in flashbacks the dialogues are often changed. And you can do whatever explanation you want to on that, but sometimes the changes are funny because they're they're writing dialogues that they you know feel like would go there. They're not actually trying to go and copy the word for word. And so at the end of the scene, whenever Spider-Man's sitting on top of the capsule and it's floating down by the parachute, he says, "Boy, the Joe inside this capsule is the real superhero." Mm -hmm. And yet that's not what he was thinking at all. Um, he was thinking that he was so awesome that I bet even Jonah stops bashing me. <laughs> so, when John Jameson that. thinks about it when John Jameson <laughs> describes the scene <laughs> Spider-Man's all about how John's the real hero but really Spider-Man thinks that he's the, himself the real hero and then I landed and was greeted by my three girlfriends She-Hulk, Ashley Kafka <laughs> and Christine Sanders I hate well, it when she became his girlfriend partner in love. Uh, there, was, there was one I remember this this is, this is where we started talking about Spider-Man Blue all, all the time because they, they did the scene in Spider-Man Blue but was what's his name, Mr. Kellogg or something? The guy who gives him the motorcycle, Mr. Kraft. And the and the and Spider Man Blue was just like this big, burly, like you know, bald guy with the with the handlebar mustache and like the leather vest. He's like, motorcycles are just like women, kid. You gotta try them out before you decide if you want them. And it's like, I, I just thought it was about like, at the big at the end of this issue, Gwen, uh, she you had the impression that she's sort of like surprised at Peter for getting his motorcycle. Where in Spider Man Blue, she's like she's like supremely turned on. She's like. Oh, I like it fast. Ha 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 ha. And it's just, <laughs> no, I, that's what she really does. It's, it's, I know, sweet little innocent Gwen. Yeah, it's like she, you can tell she's she, she's getting soaked down there because of that. Just, wow. 
Oh. <laughs> no, I don't mind you saying it. It's just way over the line for you. You're usually pretty domesticated, sir. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Jo- I, I should throw out that Jonah Jameson lets loose a great Caesar's ghost in this, which yeah, I thought yeah. was pretty funny. Because yeah, yeah. this is 1966. The, the tropes and, then Perry, of- and then Perry White goes to kick his ass. Yeah, Perry White's <laughs> been saying great Caesar's ghost for the better part of 15 years at this point, so that was pretty funny. This is where the sequel in the future, like, like lawsuits and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. The great Caesar's ghost lawsuit. <laughs> so our ad for this month for more Marvel Masterpieces on sale now, uh, features uh, several oversized books. We had the Thor King Size Special Number 2, where Thor goes up against the Destroyer. And this is the Destroyer's second outing. I'm actually thinking I want to read this and also get Journey into Mystery 118 and 119, because that was their first fight, just because he's going to be in the movie this summer. And it would Mm -hmm. be kind of cool to have some reference on that. So if you want to read about the Destroyer, um, Journey into Mystery 118, 119, and Thor Annual Number 2. We also have Marvel Superheroes Special Number 1. This is not the same Marvel Superheroes series that we'll be revisiting with Spidey uh, in Issue 14. This is actually just a one-off that was never continued. It has reprints of Daredevil's Origin Issue, The Avengers Number 2, and a 10-page Submariner story from Marvel Mystery Comics Number 8, where he confronts the Human Torch for the first time in the Golden Age. And that's actually a really good story. If y'all have never read the Human Torch Submariner fight from the Golden Age, it's pretty cool. And the Submariner strips, the Torch strips are good. The Submariner strips generally are just very, very, very good. Have y'all read any of that stuff? Anyone here? Yeah, a few of them. I remember, like, there's this policewoman who's like, Oh, I just know that even though Namor is killing the human race, that he has a good heart. I just know it. (laughs) Exactly. I've not read too much Golden Age Marvel, but I do know what's shocking me up because it was referenced in... The, the thing I always talk about, marbles. Yeah. And um, the, the Submariner strip is actually serialized, so each strip le- leads one into the other. So his going up against the torch was actually the end result of several, you know... It wasn't super complex, you know, interweaving of plots because it was the Golden Age, but it was a pretty cool story build up to that. The other thing about this book is that it has Stan Lee's very first work for Marvel, which was a two-page Captain America prose piece from Captain America Comics number three. And also we have Marvel Collector's Item Classics number five, which we don't really care about. It's running reprints from the Fantastic Four, Iron Man, Watcher, Doctor Strange, Incredible Hulk. Um, It's interesting to note that of the three oversized 25 center books that are listed here, you actually only have 30 pages of new material. The Thor annual has one new story and then some reprints, and everything else is reprints. It was cheating, conniving bastards. I know, right? I mean, 25 cents? You know how many movies you see back in that day? I assume. Well, it's double the... 25. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) It's double the price of a comic. Can you imagine paying six or eight books for a book that was half reprints? I would never do that. (laughs) I mean, a regular-sized story and then reprints. I mean, they're they're, they're kind of doing reprints now. I mean, DC is kind of doing a lot of these, like, really jumbo-sized, like, like $8... Issues where they're reprinting several issues, but it's good because I actually don't have those issues. I guess it's good for people who've not read them, but whenever I hear Marvel doing this back in the day, it just seems so so uh, hollow to me, but I don't, I don't know what it is. If To me, it seems like if you're going to charge an extra dollar or two for a book, and it's going to have reprints in it, you also need to make your main story really, really good and longer than you. Um, like Annual 3. Yeah. Kind annual of maybe. Yeah. So um, the Marvel Bullpen Bulletins brings us newsworthy notes and nutty nonsense from your friendly neighborhood bullpen. There are several cool items here. I'm not going to read them like I have in the past because I think that gets kind of boring. But they do announce the start of the Marvel Superheroes TV show, which would premiere in September. This is the Grand Trey Lawrence show that uses uh, still art from the comics and animates it. So I know that we talked about that some with Scott on the show, and we'll talk about it more when we get to September. But um, I think I might rewatch that. Um, dude i totally need to run those songs during our breaks once we, get to, <laughs> once we get to the um once we get to the september issues going forward i'm totally gonna run those songs and breaks <clears throat> I, remember when, I remember when youtube was first born which dates this podcast pretty heavily and i first saw those like intros like 
Because um, I, I actually seen the Captain America when I was a kid, but I saw like the Iron Man, Hulk, and Thor ones, and my jaw dropped. I, I just I just couldn't believe they wrote those songs. But the Captain was, America one's actually pretty cool, but the rest of them are pretty bad. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> I rented – there was, like, a VHS of it that I rented at Blockbuster when I was little, and I remember, like, yeah. oh, my – the laziest animation I've ever seen. And, yes, I know it was a different time period and there was different animation standards, but no, 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 no. No, there's no. a shot, like, when the Avengers – when the Avengers find Captain America, like, and they take him into their ship and he's fighting them, there's there's a shot where, like, you can see, like, the window, you can see, like – Steve Rogers' body floating in the ocean after they've already put him in the, in the ship, which is awesome <laughs> and terrible. Well, I think there's some backstory on, on – it helps explain why the animation was so poor. I think that other than making the deal and supplying the, or the source material, the animators didn't get a whole lot of support from Marvel. I seem to remember hearing that, that they were kind of left on their own and were expected to turn these comics into cartoons. And so I don't, I don't know if that's if that's true or not. I just seem to remember somebody saying that in the conversation. Bond, do you do you know these cartoons that we're talking about? Have you seen them or are you familiar with them? No, actually not. Um, I'm so intrigued right now that as you're talking about it, I'm doing a frantic YouTube search because I really want to hear the theme songs. Okay. Oh yes. Um, oh yes, you do. <laughs> the the cartoon itself is called Marvel Superheroes, and it's listed on uh, Wikipedia. They're uh, under that name. I don't know how you would find them on YouTube except for maybe putting the word 1960s in your search, 1960s Captain America theme or something like that. But basically what it is... When Captain America throws his mighty shield. Um, it, was a, it was a five day a week show and I forget exactly the order but it was something like Monday was Iron Man, Tuesday was Namor, Wednesday was Captain America, Thursday was the Hulk, and Friday was Thor. And they were actually taking the comic stories directly out of the comics and adapting them to animation. They would use they would they would pull and cut and paste from various issues to get the different kinds of dramatic poses they wanted, which kind of <laughs> Scott talked about this kind of throws a wrench into Thor issues because when you have Odin from different poses, they actually pull from different comics, and Odin never wears the same thing twice. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh. By today's standards, it's pretty terrible to watch, but I understand that a lot of kids really, really enjoyed it in the 60s and when it was in reruns in the 70s. I remember no, the, reading um, um, uh, the, the comics journal colon Jack Kirby, and he remembers that – I mean he talks about going to work for Marvel Studios or go to work for that, um, those companies to help lend them his comics. I see. But yeah, I think I think I'm going to be pulling those theme songs into the show in the next few episodes. There's also discussion in the uh, both my bulletins about all the merchandise that are out there because uh, they've been there've been a lot of stuff going on the market. They do mention paperback books featuring the Fantastic Four, Spidey, Thor, and the Hulk going on sale in July. These are the hodgepodge black and white reprint books that I think we mentioned on an earlier episode. I seem to remember us talking about that. Yeah, but we also have like plastic model hobby kits and jigsaw puzzles and board games, all featuring Spidey. So lots of stuff out there. Batman fans might perk your ears when I mention that Dennis O'Neill gets a whole paragraph in this thing. Evidently, in all of Stan's recent ravings about new talent at Marvel, he has neglected to mention Dandy Denny O'Neill. <clears throat> so what Denny did was he whined and complained. And so now he gets mentioned, just enough for them to tell the story about his whining and complaining. At this what? time... The man who would leave his mark forever on the Bronze Age of Batman and Green Lantern was writing, wait for it, Millie the Model. Uh, <laughs> how disappointing is that? I need to, <laughs> I, I need to see those issues. <laughs> As um, does me. Basically every issue from like 65 to 69 is Denny O'Neill. Millie, you, yeah. Millie, you've done everything to help the blonde people, the brunette people, and the redhead people. <laughs> what, about, what about the what about the freckled people? The bald I can't. I I I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty terrible. This um, answer, uh, female companion here gets plastic surgery. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm trying to figure out a way to spoof the Speedy as a junkie thing. <laughs> that was my shot. <laughs> My friend, Patsy Walker, using diet pills? She sleeps around? 
Um, he, he, he was doing a little bit more than that. He had done a few strips on Doctor Strange and even a Nick Fury Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. one, but actually his last Doctor Strange story hit the stands this month. And from here, it's romance and occasional westerns until 1968. And I'm wondering if maybe that's why he went to D.C. two years later. <clears throat> we probably won't have cause again to mention him unless there's something really tangentially related until we get to Amazing Spider-Man 207 when he begins one of the most epic and memorable runs on Amazing Spider-Man of the 1980s. Oh yeah, Madam Web, you know. <laughs> it's actually not that memorable at all. But um, finally, the end of the debate about whether Marvel should continue to bash the competition. The poll results are in, and the decision is evenly matched. So mm-hmm. they will just bash them when they feel like it and ignore them the rest of the time. Like all proud people do. Yeah. So after the bullpen bulletins, we do get another half-page ad for Fantastic 455 with the return of the Silver Surfer. This is where he visits Alicia, and Ben Grimm gets jealous because he thinks he's trying to make a move on her. So he decides to think with his fists for the rest of the issue. Which is, which is you know, surprising and new for him. Right. Yeah. yeah. Imagine that. Alicia <laughs> cheating on Ben <laughs> with another superhero. That would never happen. And finally, the letters pages. Now, I was sleepy when I read it, so I didn't really catch a whole lot of stuff that was going on this month. People really liked Spider-Man 38, weirdly enough. Um, Nothing was said in the letters about the pending change in artists that was announced that issue. But Bill Fletcher did call them on making fun of student protesters. Um, But I know that you... Because I think about how radical the changes in a few issues where Peter's always for them. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) But I know that um, I know that you saw something there, Josh. Oh yes, um, Martin, weird last name from Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> says, "And Miss, whatever your name is, JJJ's new secretary. My ESP sends flash the name Mary J. Watson into my mind the minute that I saw her. Could it be? No, sorry, Martin. Nice try. Oh, Hail. hold on. Can we rule it out? Like, because if you read Parallel Lives, oh, and." God. And Untold Tales issue 16, we know that Mary Jane followed Peter around trying to, like, get a better sense of who he was. Maybe she, like, wore a really bad wig and, like, some gl- and like you know, something and, like, went to the Daily Bugle offices to get a better look at him. Probably not. I was say, you know what my favorite part about that is? It's completely impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you, you say that now. It'll be retconned by the end of the year. <laughs> I'm gonna work yes. at Marvel and like and wreck on that story in just 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 for you. And then it cuts to like, like like me holding like the comic up and then like putting it down on an angry face like Berto. And Mary Jane says, "I know, I know, you're freaking out now, aren't you?" <laughs> touche. <laughs> oh, touche. One moment in time reference, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Next ish, you guessed it, we're not quite finished with Jonah's son yet. Not by a long shot. You'll be hearing quite a bit more about those mysterious spores which he encountered while orbiting in space. And don't be too surprised at the fantastic events that develop involve a certain friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Wait, Spider-Man's going to be in this book? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So get here early for your first sight of the exquisitely elusive Mary Jane Watson and for a whole caboodle of startling situations and amazing action that'll really grab you. That's Spidey number 42, the mag for people who avoid the ordinary. See you, Tiger. Oh, you know, see you, Tiger, that's a nice... Yeah, yeah, I know, right? And we will be back to talk about the annual after the break. You are cordially invited to attend a podcast that observes the unfolding events of history. Come with me and observe the birth and growth of a legend. From the pages of a 10 cent pulp comic book to the newspapers radio program adventures, theatrical films, and more. Witness the dawn of the superhero. Golden Age Superman 
available on iTunes and at goldenagesuperman.libsyn.com. Every legend has a beginning. Amazing Spider-Man King Size Special 3 was released on August 2nd, 1966 with a cover date of November. It actually has a month of a cover date on an annual, which is kind of weird. Issue 42 was released only the following week, and down the road, I'd like to keep the books that are released in the same month together, but at this point, it was just more trouble than it was worth. So here we are. They are no longer called annuals, it seems, but King Size Specials. This is true across the Marvel lineup. I would tell you why that is, but... I just don't know. We have an awesome cover. Absolutely amazing. There is banner text all over it. Spider-Man special, 72 big pages. King size special. All new. Spidey faces the mighty Avengers and the Incredible Hulk. Nuff said. And you know what? Yeah, that's pretty much all you have to say about that. Um, oh, definitely. Also, we have along the bottom some blurbs about the reprints, plus the most action-packed of all the Doc Ock opuses. Both in one book for the first time, see why Dr. Octopus has been called the greatest villain of all. Return of Dr. Octopus, unmasked by Dr. Octopus, attempted rape by Dr. Octopus. (laughs) Attempted? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Betty, I'm home! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this was a 25 cent book instead of the usual 12. For doubling your money, you get normal size Spidey story and two Spidey backups. But I guess but that's no just the way it's pages work. with the burglar. The burglar? No splash pages with the burglar. Oh, yeah, the like splash pages. Stuff. That's right. There's all drunk and everything. So if you open the book, on the inside of the front cover, you have some really nice black and white Spidey art on what is essentially a table of contents with some credits for the assembly of the book. They are. It says, the third thrill-packed collection of our wooly web-slingers, most marvelous masterpieces, proudly presented by Stan Lee, Pandemonium Presider, Saul Brodsky, Production Planner, Roy Thomas, Panel Proofreader, Marie Severin, Pages Paster-Upper, Stan G, Picture Pigmenter, Flo Steinberg, Paintbrush Procurer, and Irving Forbush, Problem Provider. And uh, I may post a link to the, uh, uh, a picture of this art because it's probably not in all the reprints it's, that are out there. Yeah, I, it's I not in the essentials. No, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I can see it right now, but I have the essentials, and I know it's not in there. So now, I don't know if anyone cares about this next little bit but me, but in the Indicia, this book is not titled ASM Annual or ASM King Size Special. It's just Amazing Spider-Man. Published monthly, except November, semi-monthly, volume one, number three, 25 cents per copy. So I don't know exactly what all that means, but it seems like, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I th- I don't care at all about that, but I don't mind that you care about that. So. Oh, well, thank you, Don. You're so sweet. <laughs> Flo Steinberg dropped the ball. Okay. <laughs> now, before we actually get into the story, I just want to remind us of where these characters are in relation to one another, Spider-Man and the Avengers. Spider-Man has been a hero longer than the Wasp, longer than Iron Man, longer than Hawkeye. He's been around by the same length of time as Thor, and not quite as long as Goliath if we count his first Tales to Astonish 27 monster story version. But if we're going to start from his superhero revival in Tales to Astonish 35, then Spidey has been doing his stuff longer. So the only person who has solid amounts of experience on Spider-Man is Captain America, but he was still in the ice when Spider-Man fought Dr. Octopus and the Sandman. And on top of that, they barely met. So really, to me, Spider-Man wins over all of these guys. I had no idea. I, I never knew that. Yeah. So barring future retcons and gap filler stories, Spider-Man has seen the Avengers three times. First was when Iron Man asked him for help looking for the Hulk, and Spider-Man was kind of rude and blew him off. Second was from a distance, whenever Spider-Man destroyed his robot double that Kang had sent back from the future. I feel like this is like comedy, but it's actually really stuff that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and third, he helped Hawkeye out briefly at Reed. When he and the Wasp opened up a cupcake shop together <laughs> for, well, for a week, oh, that was... <laughs> yeah, hilarious. sitting around hilarious. And, hilarious. And, and hijinks ensued. And third, Spider-Man did help Hawkeye out briefly at Reed's and Sue's supervillain extravaganza they called a wedding. So they haven't had many encounters, and admittedly they weren't the nicest. But Spidey was doing all this before the little group ever came together. So now with that in mind, 
The Avengers in our first opening panels are sitting around a table staring at the life-sized poster of Spider-Man that they got whenever they sent in a dollar for that mystery tube that the Green Goblin was holding in the ad. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's just that, like, <laughs> we've studied that photo of Spider-Man long enough. Are you serious? Exactly. <laughs> Continue. I know, that just killed me every time. The Steve Bitcoin is amazing. Yeah, 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 but do, do we really want to offer him membership? So Cap's going to call the meeting. Do they offer Avengers membership to Spider-Man? That's the question. Hawkeye gives an enthusiastic yes, which makes sense because he's the one who got Spidey help last time around. Thor is cautious about whether or not he can be trusted. Iron Man is useless, and Janet is psycho. I vote no. I hate anything to do with spiders. And of course, Hank oh, yeah, King. yeah, yeah, but we're, we're still doing this. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is the last time. No, oh. it's not. This <laughs> carried through into the 80s. The oh, 80s. Really? There's an 80s spectacular book where they're like teaming up and she says, Wasp have a natural dislike for spiders. Okay, well, I'm it's the last for the well, We're definitely going to milk it through the course of this issue, but after this issue, we don't see it for a long time. Um, and then, like, Betty Brant comes back with a vengeance. Yeah. <laughs> and Hank Pym says that Spider-Man must be tested. Not for, like, you know, diseases or anything <laughs> i should pause to point out that thor and iron man aren't regular members at this point the team in the regular avengers comic has been consisting of captain america the pims well they're not the pims yet because they're not married but hank and janet hawkeye scarlet witch and quicksilver but those last two are off on a personal leave right now because they're having troubles with their powers and they're off to visit where they grew up or something like that i forget exactly what uh, in fact, it's the absence of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch that has helped spawn this whole discussion of adding Spider-Man to their numbers. Oh, and I forgot the credits. How is this for a zingy combo? Script written by Smilin' Stan Lee, layouts by Jazzy Johnny Ramita, pencilin' by Dashin' Donnie Heck, inkin' by Mirthful Mickey DeMeo, and lettering by adorable Artie Simic. So Johnny Ramita only did the layouts here. It's actually Don Heck who's doing the pencils, and you can kind of tell. Well, I, I gotta say real quick. I, when I was reading this um, earlier for uh, for purposes of this, I never really recognized or even remembered that that um, Ramita only did the layouts. In fact, honestly, because I can pretty much make Mickey DeMio's uh, inking all over the place, but I couldn't tell that he only did. I, I thought that Ramita, this is pretty Ramita heavy. I saw a lot of, but there are some th- there are some panels where it looks like other people have done it. So I found that surprising this early, this early in the game that Ramita wasn't doing the lion's share of the work. I can see Ramita in the de- in the compositions and in the designs, but I can mm-hmm. definitely see Don Heck in the actual details of the penciling. People's faces, especially, are not John Ramita faces. Um, right. But anyways, I'm not a, I'm not as big of an art connoisseur as you are. That's I just I try to try to find people's. Penciling. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying that I I don't have as good of an eye for it as you have. Um, I, just, I, I, got you. Uh, I try to find patterns, but I'm not always very good at it. So the Avengers decide to contact someone who has had a little more experience with Spidey than they have, i.e. Daredevil. Janet is this in is favor so of embarrassing. Yeah, Janet wants to call Daredevil. She really likes this idea because she needs to get laid. And then Hank slaps her down. Good idea. I just love to know if he's as dreamy looking in person as I heard he is. That will be enough of that young lady. <laughs> no, uh, we, we didn't make it. We didn't make it. <laughs> no, no, no. There will be there will be bitch slapping in this story. I, I promise. Not really, but in the jokes. So the way they go about this whole contacting Daredevil thing is kind of interesting and mostly insane. They begin. I got shut up. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. They're they're gonna um, blanket New York City with high frequency radio signals, transmitting. How do they know that this is his powers? <laughs> Yeah, how do they know that this is his powers? Oh, yeah, and this isn't his powers. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> and also, Never mind, it's like, Daredevil, you're wanted at the Avengers, this top secret exclusive club. Oh, yay. Daredevil, we want to talk to you. Well, we're adding new people to our membership. Yes, yes, yes. And we were thinking, yes, could you talk oh, to us? That was totally my gag. <laughs> <laughs> and Daredevil's like smiling the whole time, like, why, of course. <laughs> it's like Daredevil, he's, he's like, well, you know, if you can't find Spider Man, I am actually not a member of a team. And then, like, everybody's like, get out of here. 
Oh, this guy. <laughs> this guy. So you, 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 y'all, are, you, y'all are right, but it's getting a little bit ahead of what I was, was saying. I just want to tell back and say that he does get the signal, despite all logic. And he moments later, he does arrive at Avengers Mansion, where they tell him that they don't want him. They want his friend, Spider-Man. <laughs> they ask him about Spider-Man while Jan begins undressing him with her eyes and talking about it out loud. And Daredevil says nice things about Spidey that get asterisks pointing us back to Spidey 16 and Daredevil 16 and 17, all of which we've discussed in earlier episodes, number 10, 25, and 26, if you want to go listen. But then Daredevil leaves, and we never see him again. (laughs) Ever. Three panels, Daredevil. Hope you enjoyed the the pimpage. Now go away. (sighs) It's kind of of like an annual one where they had all those heroes in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, referencing everything. Well... I would have thought that Daredevil would have gotten more exposure because John Romita was drawing Daredevil at the time, but I guess not. <clears throat> so all the Avengers agree to let him be tested for membership, not for AIDS. Hawkeye is annoyed because it took everyone else half an hour to get to the same conclusion with which we, he had started. Yeah. <laughs> Jan continues to be mildly insane. I won't let my natural wasps aversion to spiders prejudice me. I vote yes also. I'm proud you're of you, a- honey. Spidey gets the fight <laughs> do. I'm proud of you for realizing that you're not a bug. <laughs> you're not actually a wasp, Jan. <laughs> you're just a girl who grows wings. Quiet, quiet, I'll sting you. <laughs> Don't make me use my air gun on you again. <laughs> oh, yeah, the air gun. <laughs> Silly us. And, yeah. and then, and then like, Ken's like elbowing Thor, and he's like, air gun, can you believe this? <laughs> If I was Spider-Man, like, I'd be like, okay, okay, you want to know why I should join the Avengers? Here's why. You have the Wasp on your team. The Wasp. You're going to let her on and not me? Exactly. She's a female. Well, that- she does have a point. The Wasp is a female. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good reason to have her around. She's easy on the eyes. And so the quest begins. <laughs> Thor, Hawkeye, Iron Man, and Goliath begin scouring the city for any signs of our favorite webhead. And now, on page five, he finally shows up for the first time in his own book. Speaking of page five, on the top panel, far right, is that Ben Urich snapping a news photo? Uh, yeah. Um, he oh. hasn't been. He hasn't. He has. He hasn't been invented yet. No, he is right here. <laughs> it does kind of look. Wait, like okay. It. Oh, the guy in the green shirt. Yeah, green jacket. I vote for that being a proto Ben Urich, earlier in his career before he became a Daredevil member. I mean, Daredevil was here, so wherever Daredevil is, Ben York must be short. Oh, gone. yeah, see? See, it all ties together. I think my th- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Spider Man's spider sense is beginning to tingle, which is only supposed to happen when danger occurs, but it actually makes sense because of all the crazy shites that's about to go down. He sees Thor, and this is basically how the conversation goes Hey, look, it's Thor. The Avengers want you. Get your ass over here so we can find out if you're good enough to be on the team. Um. What? Why are you hesitating? The Avengers are awesome. Why do you even have to think twice? Come here so I can hit you with my... Uh, oh, okay, you yeah, have 24 hours. Yeah, I That is all. <laughs> by the bristling beard of Odin. Throw away. I love how he has to swear by Odin's bristling beard. That's... I guess he did say that like a couple pages ago. And I was like, that's rather obnoxious. So Spidey decides this is acceptable social behavior and that Thor seems pretty cool. He goes home and Aunt May asks him to go to get medicine for her because she's too dead to do it herself. Which is good, since she's thinking of living without him now. She's too dead to live with him herself. <laughs> <laughs> so he hops on his new bike, because comics have continuity, and he drives down Introspection Lane to the Life Choices drugstore. And he gets the meds and he heads back home, having he decided was. that the fates and the fairies have decided that he must become an Avenger. Yeah, he's all, he's all like, you know, mentally cogitating about the whole plot while he's doing this errand for his aunt. And he's actually really excited now. He wants to be an Avenger. He wants to be on a super team, make contributions to you know, the world and do good things. And it's kind of sad that this is not what's going to happen for him. <laughs> well, he was number one. What are you talking about? He's in like five Avengers books right now. I know, right? <laughs> so when he gets to Avengers Mansion, it's all hearts and smiles. There's a great, actually a really, really great one-page splash of the team welcoming him. The only drawback is that it's absolutely covered in speech balloons. Spidey is a little bit overwhelmed, even, by all the love that he's getting. But he is ready to fight whomever they want as his test. Easy, fella. Hold it. It's not that kind of test. What other kind of test is there to join a fighting team? We were just discussing the same thing when you arrived. 
we haven't quite come to a decision ourselves yet. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> wait, 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 what? <laughs> it's, they don't know how to induct new members. I think that they should have, like, maybe just done the tell us a little bit about yourself thing. That's what I do on here. <laughs> it yeah. sounds like a good idea. Uh. It, it, even earlier, Thor had said it was the Avengers' way to do this. <laughs> when have they ever done this for anyone? For, they never have, and they never will again. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is why, because <laughs> of this reaction. Not only do we know that this isn't how they do things, but they themselves realize that they're just completely making up rules as they go. <laughs> so... <laughs> Mm-hmm. Spider-Man questions, on, questions them on it. Thor basically tells him, shut the f*** up. <laughs> Sit down, boy. <laughs> but like two pages later, doesn't don't they sort of imply that the lack of a test was the test? Uh, Spider-Man thinks that. But uh, he, he's, he's, uh, he thinks they're too smart, though. <laughs> so, yeah, Spidey gets annoyed. They're even like, um, you should like leave now while we talk about what your test is going to be. You invited me over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know how I say like the Fantastic Four are jerks? The Avengers are able. Can you, the Avengers are idiots. The Fantastic Four are jerks, but the <laughs> you imagine this translating to like a date? Like you ask a girl out, and then you ask her to like you know sit in the movie lobby while you wonder if she's a good girlfriend or not watching the movie. Yeah, I, the, the, the image I see is like a bowl of popcorn on your. Isn't head. that how you met your wife? Well, yeah, but I mean, I was younger then. I, I made silly decisions. How to do it? <laughs> So Spidey's getting annoyed and walks. It was established that John Wilson and his wife met under different circumstances in podcast episode number four. (laughs) (laughs) Josh Bertoni doing fanboy voice. Um, Wasp even whispers, I don't like it, Hank. Spider-Man's starting to look angry. I'm not sure how he's looking angry since you can't see his face, but okay. Body language. No, there's a, there's a, there, they've done this joke in the comics. Like he, there are two panels next to each other, and he says, "This is my sad face, and this is my happy face," and it's just Spider-Man sitting there looking at you. <laughs> that reminds me like like the meme of uh, Steven Seagal, like but all like, the emotions the, is the same face. The way that somebody breathes and like their body language could could tip you up. Okay, okay, yeah, it's fair. Well, he's probably being impatient that these idiots didn't think of anything for him to do. Like, oh no, Spider-Man's getting slightly upset that we've not done anything to him. <laughs> Go solve world hunger. <laughs> and bring it back to Avengers Mansion. <laughs> right. So all this talk about not being sure how to test him, combined with his worry about Aunt May, yeah, Peter snaps a bit. And then they overreact to his overreaction. And before you know it, Spidey's beating up Hawkeye. <laughs> no, he, he goes for his throat. <laughs> Literally. He's like, I'll kill you! I'll kill all of you! <laughs> this would have been... You do it! This would have been funnier if they just would have cut out those middle panels. And, like, it starts with, like, you go from the splash page of, like, nice to meet you, Spider-Man. And then you get, like, the caption <laughs> five minutes later. And you see, like, Spider-Man <laughs> lunging it and the ball fight. <laughs> that, 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 that's a comic strip waiting to happen, like a webcomic or something, you know. Superheroes in Marvel land all meet. Everything's happy. Five minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Goliath and Thor do manage to break up the fight, and Spidey is still kind of peeved, but Iron Man finally has an idea for a test. They called him to their mansion and beat him up. Yeah. He's peeved. (laughs) Hey, guys, remember when we lost the Hulk, and we spent like 10 or 15 issues trying to find him and bag him and bring him back, and, you know, we never could do it? Let's make this guy do it, and, (laughs) and, you know, that'll, that'll mean he can join our team. (laughs) <laughs> let's give him the task that we haven't been able to do. <laughs> and let's not tell him why we want, want him back. Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. So Spidey's like, you mean all I've got to do is... You can't dr- hear us. Oh, well. It's not important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Spidey's like, you mean all I have to do is drag the Hulk back here and I become an Avenger? And now Goliath's all condescending. It's not as easy as it sounds, son. And of course, Spider-Man knows this because he fought the Hulk before there were Avengers. Oh, yeah. And the big man issue. Yeah. Not the big man issue. The uh, the other advent- enforcers issue. The one, yeah, the one with Hollywood and the Green Goblin. No, yeah, I, was Green joking, Goblin in the I was joking because in this issue they give the wrong footnotes. It's probably been re- fixed in some reprints, but uh. Yeah, I don't see that. Yeah, and oh, they, you're they right. The- they do. They say Spidey number ten. You're right. Later on, we haven't gotten there yet. I understand. I have a mental image of it saying number ten, but I didn't actually process that being the wrong issue last night. That's yeah, stop reading these like after midnight. Well, I was up late talking to some guys on Skype. 
So that always <laughs> For some reason, though, Spider-Man has forgotten just how much trouble he had back in issue 14, because he gets the idea it's going to be all easy-peasy this time. Now, before I go on, I have to point out that Stan is trying to bring in some lingo, having Peter call Cap, Dad. Just out of his cage, Dad. I'll have oh, my- is, that, is, that, is that our first Dad? I think that's our first Dad. I know we're going to make fun of Mary Jane for it later, Hooray! but that's Peter like, started. Like, like, dated yeah. as hell lingo <laughs> in, these, in these Spider-Man comics. It actually makes a little bit of sense with Peter calling Cap that, because even though Cap's physically the same age as uh, maybe five years older than Spider-Man, he's, you know, been around for 20 more years. Actually, I got to think about that now. Spider-Man is college age, so he's 19. I think we established he's not yet 20. And yeah. Captain America had graduated college? No. He was out of high school going into um, college age when the war started. So yeah, how, how, how old was Steve Rogers when he became Captain America? Like I think he's like 18 or 19 when he becomes Captain America, and he spends three of the years of the war fighting as Cap. So he's like 21, 22 when he goes in the ice. I, I, never, I never actually thought about that. That's, that's interesting. So right now he would be about like 22 or something like that. Yeah, he's think? only been out of the ice for a, a year, you know, maybe a year. Comic time is always funky, but let's say a year. So he's only he only has two or three biological years on Spider-Man. Well, yeah, he actually would have aged during Everyone that. knows that you don't age in ice. Yeah, <sighs> I don't age when I'm on ice. Do you? When I'm cold, like my body slows down, including <laughs> my age. So Spidey leaps away, thinking about how he's never fought the Hulk. Oh wait, never mind. I'm sorry, that was a, a artifact of a previous note. Um, Spidey leaps away, but he he does think about it as if he's never thought him. Fought it's him like he's never fought the Hulk, but they and acknowledge later members, that he does. Like a page later. Yeah, it's it's a weird writing because he's talking like, well, if if he's as dumb as I've heard, it should be easy. And as he's leaving, Goliath is like, wait, we didn't say we want the Hulk. To which I say, yeah, you did, Goliath. You said, bring him to us. And Spidey said, I'll bring him to you. And then he left. There was that conversation. But wait. Uh, but wait. <laughs> and then Thor says, we can explain later. <laughs> well, the Avengers are able. The Hulk, we didn't really need for him to bring the Hulk. <laughs> uh, when we get to the end of the story, like the ramifications of this are actually really effing depressing when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll bring that up when we get there. Because like, this yeah. is this this is not a comedy of errors. This is a tragedy of errors. <laughs> so Spidey leaves, and there's a news bulletin about to hit the bugle about the Hulk's location. But Stan and Johnny don't have a reason to get Spidey into the bugle. So, oh wait, he's thirsty. <laughs> yeah, that's pointless. <laughs> he's gonna go pester Jonah and get a drink from the water cooler, and then he can hear when Foswell bursts in. JJ. A flash just came over the newswire. The Hulk's been spotted near the downtown Gamma Ray Research Center. Side Did you note, science? Science? <laughs> Side note, while Spidey's quenching his deep down body thirst, Jonah calls for the police, and he gripes, No concern, I don't know what their proper area code number is. Area codes were actually pretty new at this point. They had been oh, yeah. used in some major cities before this, but in the 50s, local dialing was often done with just the name of the region and then a four or five digit sequence. The area code system that we have now had just been rolled out nationwide in 1966. Golly! I'm back in history class. <laughs> <laughs> in a bad way? I've, I've, I feel like I'm uh-huh. sitting down in front of my grandpa's chair and he's like telling me like the way things used to be. Well, whenever they pull out culture notes in the comics, like, I think it's kind of cool to you know find out what the world was like at the time. Oh, yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not writing anymore. I, just, I never do that. Oh, no, no, yeah, I'm... I'm I don't mean this in a condescending way, but that, 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 that actually is fascinating. Okay, well, cool. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a situation where they change the area codes or reconfigured the area codes in your area. I've actually had that happen like three or four times in my life. But the whole nation is going through that now, learning a whole new phone number system. It's kind that, of cool. um, that happened when I lived in Springfield. Like, part of the town got new area codes, so we like split the town in the middle, and then the who came. <laughs> Did, did, did anyone get that? No. No. Yeah, no, 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 no. The Simpsons, the Simpsons episode. Yeah, that was the Simpsons episode. Like, half of Springfield got a new area code, and it, like, drove the town to, like, you know, split itself in half, like, with a chalk line down the middle. And then the Who came, and, like, the town argued over who gets the Who. Yeah, I remember that. I'm not, I'm not saying in a long time, but I remember that. Who came? Then. <laughs> <Ba-dum. laughs> Okay, so Spidey leaves and heads for the Gamma Ray Research Center, because he just knows where that is. And sure enough, there's the Hulk, looking less tall and monstrous and more squat and box-shaped, with really, 
freaking big hands in that first panel. Full show. For all you Hulk files out there, Hulk actually did go to New York and tell us to Astonish 84, which was the latest issue before this came out. So this story does fit in very nicely with that continuity. And Hulk just wants what he always wants, to be left the hell alone. So when he sees so Spider-Man... So he went to the busiest city in the world. I think he was hounded to the biggest city in the world. I don't know. I haven't read that Hulk story in a very, very long time, but um, that's the memory I have. So when he sees Spider-Man invading his space, he just attacks. Granted, he hasn't had the best time in New York, you know, being hunted by General Ross and all. So it's kind of understandable that he's in a sour mood, but he does just, you know, attack at first sight. And there are two pages of really solid action between the two, uh, between Spider-Man and the Hulk, before the Hulk smashes a room of gamma-ray testing devices. The resulting radiation that pours out turns the Hulk back into Bruce Banner and kills (laughs) Spider-Man. So, wow thoughts. (laughs) Yeah, I totally wasn't expecting that. I know, right? (laughs) And then, like, in issue 41, you know, of Spider-Man, no, it's... 42, like, you know, it's Sunday dinner and, like, Aunt May's there and Mary Jane's there and Anna Watson's there and they're just like, Peter said he'd be here! This is the 17th time I've come over to see Peter. Just wait, Mary Jane, he'll show up this time. So, Spider-Man doesn't really die, of course. In fact, now that the Hulk is calm, we're just going to forget that there's a radiation leak right here. (laughs) I don't even know that. (laughs) So, um... Gamma rays, those are totally safe. They just turn you green, that's all. You should turn into a spider hole. We actually studied gamma rays in um, chemistry class. All I, all I could think about the entire lecture was why this didn't turn you into the Hulk. Mm, I bet. So Spider-Man and Dr. Bruce Banner, Stan does get the name right, they have a nice little moment, actually, between them. It's actually kind of cool little scene before Bruce Banner turns back into the Hulk again. Spidey bathes the Hulk in webs, wrapping him up double with lots of layers, nice and tight for the Avengers. But the talk that he had with Dr. Banner sticks in his mind, and he decides that he's not going to turn him over to the Avengers because he's not really a bad guy. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what he thinks because the Hulk just breaks free and stumbles away, dazed, confused, like a child in the dark. A short time later at the Avengers HQ, they're sitting around getting impatient that Spider-Man hasn't reported back because, you know, they couldn't catch the Hulk for a year, but giving Spider-Man an hour or two is too much. And Spidey does eventually swing by, though. He says he couldn't even find the Hulk, so never mind. Catch you later, Bill and Jan. And he goes off. They're all kind of surprised. Even Jan, much as she detests spiders, feels strangely disappointed. I'll and never understand females. <laughs> of course you won't, Hank. That's why you hit them. Hank goes well, to he's... slap her, and then Josh stops Hank and says, No, 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 I got this. As I... <laughs> 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 I was ready for him to say I told you to shut up with my mouth already oh yeah yeah. and as Jam was yelling for me to stop I said my human instincts naturally detest wasps <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a real wasp you really? <laughs> you think? so Jan evidently does not understand verbal silencing she must be backhanded Jesus Christ. <laughs> I can't wait till we get up to Shoshan issues. <laughs> we should just jump ahead. So, Peter goes home to his Aunt May, and, yeah, he's actually really torn up about everything. Um, he has gotten rather depressed over the fact that he had to throw away his chance to be a part of one of the world's greatest fighting teams. Why does nothing seem to work out right for me? Even when I win, I lose. But I'll keep telling myself that it all worked out for the best. And maybe, someday, I might even believe it. The end. This is, like, really depressing the more and more I think about it. Like, he could have brought the Hulk back to the Avengers, and they could have helped him, and then Spider-Man would have been an Avenger, but, like, no. Hulk is set free, and he has to go through his pain, and the Avengers can't help him, and people get injured, and Spider-Man doesn't get to be, like, the ramifications of this are actually pretty depressing. Yeah, and yeah. that's why, honestly, this is probably, like, one of my favorite uh, Spider-Man annual stories ever, like, top three. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I, 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 it's, it's not even, like, like, the goofiness of the first half, but the way it ends, I love, because Josh was actually right, I actually had, to, had thought about that a while ago, like, it's, it's like, it was so close to everything being said right, but because of a, of a moral, moral decision Spider-Man made, 
and a stupid decision that the Avengers made by not telling him, you know, it's just like w- what could have been. And I, and I love the way it ends. I really do. Well, like, it's not even like a moral decision that affected like, oh, yeah, things could have been all right for a little while or, oh, yeah, that five minute problem is now solved. Like this was like because of this, like years and years of like pain and suffering oh, exactly. winds, up ha- winds up happening. Oh, because Thor and Iron Man and Captain America, Hawkeye, Giant Man and Wash were all douches. You're like, oh, wait, we haven't explained. Uh, nah, I'll tell you later. That's not important. <laughs> I actually had forgotten when it, but the, this story ended on such a down note. I mean, I remembered the insanity with the Avengers. And I actually, for some reason, remembered the um, General Ross showing up while the Hulk was Bruce Banner. But I think that's Ultimate. I think yeah, that's what, what? happened I think that's what happens in the Ultimate Marvel team up story. Whenever this is a very, very similar scene in Ultimate Marvel team up number two and three, whenever Spidey's fighting the Hulk, at the uh, end of that story, there's a very similar scene where he's facing the Hulk. The Hulk turns back into Bruce Banner, and General Ross shows up with soldiers. And then behind <laughs> Spider-Man, Bruce turns back into the monster, and Spider-Man just gets out of the way. <laughs> so I, I was I was expecting that when I was reading it for the show last or this morning but yeah this is (laughs) it's a really mixed bag of an issue and i mean that in the emotional tone like there's comedy and then there's tragedy and it makes for a really really awesome story yeah it's it's kind of it's kind of um supplemented when when he's thinking about it because he's really like i think that um i think we really rag on peter's like idiocy and these early issues but this is one of those issues and Josh, feel free to just write stuff on my phone. But, like, um, I think it's one of those times where he thinks really logically. Like, it would be cool to be an Avenger, but what would that mean? To, you know, he would he would spend less time. Identity would be a lot more public. I, I think Peter really thinks logically in this issue. And I think that, like, at the end, he did the best he could, but he, w- he wasn't even sure of, like, the reason. He, he wasn't even sure of, like, the ramifications of what he just did. So I think that's pretty... It was played very believably, in my opinion. Yeah, the only issue I have about Peter's logic is that the Hulk has hurt people, and he's going to continue to hurt people and cause damage, and Peter does let him go, and it's like, well, this guy's going to destroy a bunch of stuff, but he has the heart of a, of a saint. It's one of those best-informed decisions. I mean, he, he tried to make the best decision he could with the information that he had. I guess, but it's, it's kind of like the equivalent of letting the burglar go. Eh, nah, I, I, I really, I really disagree with that because that one, he didn't, he made a choice not to get involved based on, based on his um, non-compliance. But this one, he made a choice based off what he thought would be a good re- resolution, not because he didn't want to get involved and be completely separate from it and be lazy. He thought he was doing the right thing here. The ramifications True. are similar. It's not similar in Peter's head, but it's similar in its effects. Yeah. The only thing I had, the only issue that I have with with all that though is that he describes delivery of the Hulk to the Avengers as being I think he says it, it would be like leading a lamb to the slaughter um, and as such he sort of like is casting the Avengers as people that slaughter people or something like that so he seems <laughs> to have like made some moral judgment that they couldn't be trusted with the problem that he himself had, knew the answer to so I think implicitly, um, he's already saying that he doesn't morally trust the Avengers. And I think that that well, sets up a lot of good stories later on. He, he, they couldn't be trusted to come up with a simple time yeah, pressure him to join the Avengers. Yeah, but he's uh, – uh, if, if, he seems to sort of like think that if he delivers them – if he delivers the Hulk to the Avengers, that something bad will happen to the Hulk. That they they don't have like the ability to morally see that, that, that he's actually like – They'll like, shoot good. him. Right, yeah, like, or something like that, yeah. Well, he has not had the best of experiences with other superheroes. And yeah, I think that he does think this is a policing effort. I think he has been sent to bag the bad guy. And he gets mm-hmm. there and he realizes there's not a bad guy to bag, so never mind. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I, I mean, I have issues with him laying the Hulk go because he knows that the Hulk's going to, like, you know, damage stuff. Well, he, I think he's, he can also just, like, well, the way the Hulk limps away, I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe at this time he's not, it's not, it's not as a certain, but. Since the Hulk did come out in 62, maybe you're right. But it's the sort of thing he would later... I mean, if we take in some of the later relationships into a care effect, he would probably say Reed Richards could help this guy and take him to Reed Richards. But Spider-Man doesn't develop that relationship with the FF for a long time, so... Right. I'll take him to Kirk Connors. He knows everything about science. Yeah. <laughs> Kirk Connors is a scientist. Quick, how heavy is this rock? Quick, tell me the gravitational weight of Mars. Quick, 
Oh, what I did for you, my friend? You've helped me once, and I'll help you forevermore. Oh no, being exposed to the gamma rays has turned me into a lizard. Oh no, but now I'm a Hulk lizard. Great Scott. I'm going to have to miss Gwen's big party. She's going to think I'm thinking out on her again. What will I do with good. six arms in my life? Page 14. Friday goes into uh, Jameson's office, and Jameson says, That voice! The voice I hate most in the whole Parker or was it Spider-Man? Oh, that is? I mean, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Unless Peter... Like, has it ever been said that Peter... I mean, they had the thing where, ah, he's wearing a, mu- a mask. That means his voice is muffled, but... Does Peter re- does it ever say that Peter changes his voice when he's Spider-Man? Like a Christian Bale sort of a deal? Well, not that really extreme, but like... Hey, like, Jameson, I- you got a drink of water? <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear to God, I swear to me! Do Where is the water? Me? Where is it? I'm a little <laughs> thirsty. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah that's, that, that's much better. Thank goodness I had that drink. <laughs> I was actually having this conversation with Lily the other day, and I was trying to think of the context. But just how much a mask muffles your voice, and does he change it? Because, like, in Smallville, Green Arrow has some sort of digital distortion going on in his voice. <laughs> and, of course, Peter doesn't have that. But on the Superman radio show, Clark and Superman have different voices. Same actor, doing talking differently. That's just, like a job for Superman. Yeah, this looks like a job for Superman. And I don't know if Peter does that. Maybe he's always like, Hi, Jameson. How you doing? You know what? In I'm the 60s part two, he did do that. In the 60s part two, he did literally make his voice a lot deeper when he was Spider-Man. They I, I, don't know, right. I don't know if that was a conscious thing that he did or if that was just one. I mean, the, the, that was there. I mean, every other cartoon... I don't think he ever did that, but in the Stitcher show, that was certainly there. So what else do we think about this issue? I could talk about how Spider-Man has met the Hawkeye before and teamed up with him. and Or not teamed up, but they fought in Untold Tales of Spider-Man back when Hawkeye was working for the Black Widow as a criminal. Mm. Oh. I um, could talk about that, but then somebody would have to take a shot. How many I, – I, I, what, what costume is Hank Pym on? His sixth by this point? <laughs> this is – this is just his first redesign. He had the red one as Ant-Man and Giant-Man. The only difference between Ant-Man and Giant-Man was um, the metal helmet. And then he d- goes to the blue and yellow thing and starts calling himself Goliath. And I think this is a period in time where he's always 10 feet tall. I don't think he's changing his size anymore. Because he goes through a nope. period where changing his size is damaging to his health. Like it could kill him. So he lives at 10 feet tall for a while. This is what they do with Hank Pym. The person has no character. He has no internal conflict. The only way they can give him drama is playing with his powers. So they'll take away his shrinking power, or they'll take away his growing power, or they'll freeze him at a size. If you change again, you're going to die. And that's the Hank Pym drama of the 60s. That's what makes him interesting. Um, I think that's where they were at this point in time. Okay, a metaphor for uh, penal size. <laughs> Um, Stanley was going through some serious issues <laughs> in the 60s. <laughs> I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> On uh, page 10, I just, I know I, I know it's war with Thor's voice, but like, I love, I just love like how, how ro- the, the scene is like, goes from rosy to like, you know, blood red in a second because Iron Man's like, look, why don't you step out of the room for a while? We'll be able to think of a, a test for you faster if you, if you're not breathing down our necks. Like, they, they get so defensive when Spider-Man asks a simple question. And then Thor is like, silence, the old fight. Like, seriously, these guys are angles. What is their problem? <laughs> like, really, the, the Avengers come off horribly in this issue. Like, they come off as just, like, the base, most pretentious, elitist jerks. It's great, fun. I love it. So who's more elitist jerks, the Avengers or the FF? Mr. Oh, the Avengers. The, the FF, well, the FF are just kind of snobby, but the Avengers are, like, snobby without anything to back it up in this issue. Because Spider-Man pretty much kicks their butts all across the place. One of the things I thought was, I don't know, to me, like, I totally buy that there are a lot of implications to the decisions that he made. But for me, the biggest problem was that I didn't get a sense that there was any defined agenda in terms of the test that they were going to put out for him. So uh, at the end of the day, um, I don't know, like the the construction of him receiving the invitation felt sort of thrown together and incoherent. Um, And because of that, the drama of his decision making like wasn't as poignant to me. Like I didn't see uh, – 
like to me, if, if I walk into this situation, I would say that this is such a such a dysfunctional like like group of folks that I would have like no interest in joining. So like like why in the world would a, a superhero who's been around longer than these other guys um, and these guys are all arrogant and complete buffoons with no real plan? Uh, like why in the world would I want to be a part of that? Like I didn't see like a massive internal conflict associated with that. So to me, that like hurt the poignancy, which I thought was great with his decision about the Hulk. Yeah. It's I, – I can see what you're saying. Like you go to – you get invited to join a group and you get to the group and they're all over the place. Right. No organization, no clue what's going on and you know now you're looking for an excuse to leave because yeah. you have no desire to be part of this group. Yeah, yeah exactly. The yeah, mighty so that Avengers, was... my Batuka. They're the Avengers. You want to be on the Avengers. Of course they are because they're the world's mightiest heroes and you get there and they're this – I mean, the thing I will say that was was pretty awesome was um, like I'm a big fan like like of all these things of, of of the really like old school phrases that have just fallen out of popular usage. And when Daredevil says that Spidey is a guy who uh, you can trust with your last saw buck, I really don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm all going. Neither does Daredevil. Yeah. He's blind, so he he has vocabulary issues. It's a ten dollar bill it comes from Chinatown. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it's a sawbuck. Yeah. And neither do I. Yeah. Okay, it's the $10 bill. The Roman numeral for 10 is a cross. Um, no, I don't get it. Never mind. But – and I also thought that there's a pretty nice caption on the last page where it says, uh, um, as Peter makes the choice not to take him in, that perhaps it's best that Peter Parker doesn't suspect the truth, that he doesn't know the Avengers wanted to help the Hulk. I mean, I was I was really thinking like, why didn't they say something about that? I mean, that was a, that was also like one of the things that seemed kind of like inconsistent about the story to me. But on the whole, I thought it was really really good. Um, and do you think that's what um, what Stan is trying? In the moment when Spidey's leaving the Avengers, and all of a sudden they're like, wait a second, does he really understand? Do you think that's what Stanley's trying to get at? Because I don't get that sense from what they're saying, but I guess I might be able to read into. I bad. think Stan was just going for irony, like, oh, Spider-Man doesn't realize that they did want to help him. Oh, yuck, yuck, yuck. And it turns to be a lot of graver situation that even Stan realized. Yeah. Oh, the Hulk is killing millions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't kill anybody. He just maims every now and then. Um, Wasn't it like Retcon, though? Oh, Retcon. Right before Planet Hulk, that Hulk, has act- that Hulk did actually, like, kill people. You I don't would know. Think, but I mean, you you also you would think, but I I, I thought it was Recon. When I came in, um, when I came back into comics, Planet Hulk was either done or almost done. So I don't know what really happened before that. Like, because I I remember it was a big controversy when like they revealed that people like did get killed in the Hulk's in the Hulk's rampage. I'm looking at, I just googled Hulk killing. People I remember it was and, a controversy when they said that like for some reason Banner could like control what the Hulk was doing and he didn't kill anybody, and people were like, what? I remember the message boards getting pretty frothy around that time. Okay, um, it says that the Hulk killed 26 people when he rampaged in Las Vegas, and that's why they shot him in this into space. Oh, that was the story right before the Planet Hulk story. I think it was actually a three-part FF story where the Fantastic Four were trying to stop him when he was rampaging on Las Vegas. I think that's what happened. Yeah, I remember reading those stories. Now I just forgot the fact that he killed those people. <laughs> How could you forget the bodies? And then Spider-Man saw it on the news, walloping web snappers, if I had only stopped the Hulk years ago, none of this would have happened. Yeah, but he thinks that every Tuesday. And then, like, a news report comes on, taxi cab crashes in the freeway, a dozen people dead, four injured. Oh, if only I would have hailed a taxi when I was downstairs, it would have been that taxi, and I would have taken it in a different direction, and those people would still be alive. Because as Peter Parker, everything is his fault. Why does everything yeah. bad have to happen to me? The first, those, those first things of the Avengers are just so, yeah, there's so much jackassery in it. We've yeah. looked at this picture long enough. Like, <laughs> I really want to know how long they looked at that picture. Is it five minutes? Is it like five hours? I want to know when they broadcast the radio waves over New York City, like how many supervillains picked them up. I know, it's, it's, it's like, it's science time! And then like, they said... Daredevil is sensitive to high frequency sounds. Let's deafen him to get his attention. Like, why didn't Daredevil just like pull him into the street when they did that? Right, and that's not how his powers work. He doesn't pick up radio waves. Oh well. 
Well, there were also reprints of Amazing Spider-Man 11 and 12 in this book, as we talked about. Uh, this was the Doctor Octopus two-parter with the death of Bennett Brandt, a new haircut for Betty, and Peter's unmasking. And you can hear our thoughts about those issues on episodes eight and nine of the show. Complete with Star Wars pants. Oh, yes. Star Wars pants is in the blooper reel on episode nine. Good stuff. There weren't any letters in this book because it was an annual or a king size special. But there was a two-page ad for the new superheroes on Saturday mornings on CBS. You had Space Ghost, Lone Ranger, and the new Adventures of Superman animated series all starting up this fall. I haven't seen any of that Superman cartoon. Has anyone seen the 1960s Superman cartoon? Uh, I, I think, think so. so. No, uh, no, sir. I may have rented videos of it when I was little. Okay, well, I'll watch it eventually when I get to my Silver Age reading. Um, my Superman read there is about 11 years shy of the premiere of this cartoon, so of course I haven't watched it yet because that's how my brain works. But throughout the lead story of the annual is a banner on the bottom of every page, Watch Marvel Superheroes on TV, and then a little lengthened arrow where the local station is supposed to be stamped in, but of course no one is going to stamp half a million comics, so... Never mind. Oh, speaking of half a million comics, that was something that was mentioned in the letters page in 41. How many issues of this book they're putting out every month? Half a million Spider-Man issues. That's the circulation in 1966. 500,000 issues of Amazing Spider-Man every month. Wow. So uh, compared to how much did they sell last month? 50,000? About 10%. 50? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 50,000. I think 50,000 50, is, is where Spider-Man floats right now. So that will just give you some perspective on the changing of the years. Yeah, most definitely. It's like 20,000 these days. And I think that's all we have. Is that all we have? Does anyone else have anything else they want to say about the two books? I, I think they were two pretty solid issues, not a bad pair. Oh, it, it, it just gets better from here. I mean, I love the Avengers Avengers annual, but like the the main title, but then the next – like, I, think, I, I think 41 was just a warm-up, honestly, compared to what's coming up next. I think Ramita's getting getting ready to tell some good stories. I think I, I think he was just kind of like you know taking a breath on forty one. Well, Mr. Benton, thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've really really appreciated uh, your your early on emailing us. Um, is it okay if I unmask you? Oh, sure. For those who might have listened to early episodes, we received an email um, from a writer who wished to remain anonymous, and I called him Bernie Schwartz. And that is our current Dr. Bond Benton with us tonight. So his secret identity has been revealed. No, yeah. back then back then I had weird students. Now I've got pretty cool students. So if they listen to this, they actually – like. by the way, if you're one of my students and you can reference some specific thing that happened in this episode, like if you happen to listen to it, um, tell me about that. And uh, um, yeah, You'll get 25 an A. Point, 25, automatic A actually. <laughs> You will pass the whole uh, course. Yeah, you don't even have to show up or anything. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll see. Bring me the head of Betty Brant. <laughs> yeah, and I will and I will give you a bachelor's degree. <laughs> <laughs> that is all. <laughs> so, Doctor Benton is a professor at Fredonia. Is it called Fredonia University in New York, or you know? Yeah, yeah, it's it's part of the SUNY system, which I understand Empire State is as well. See, I told you, Josh. In your face. Oh, yeah, yeah, yep, totally real. <laughs> and um, he no. is presenting a paper to a conference in April about Captain America. Tell the title again. Um, it's uh, uh, The Death of Captain America, Redemptive Anti-Americanism. Um, it's basically – um, I'm a little out of continuity right now, um, mostly because for about a year and a half period on this, I had to read and reread all Civil War stuff over and over again uh, for the article, um, which is largely why I'm, I'm not so current because I actually didn't want to see these guys like like for a while. Um, but yeah, um, it's on the death of Captain America and uh, about like why they killed him uh, and what were the political implications of it. Uh, but it's it was it was a good time, and uh, anyone who wants to read it, you know, um, uh, it'll probably be up on the website. Hopefully, it'll be published in a book pretty soon. But I'll keep you guys updated. Cool. Oh yes. Okay. Well, thank you again very much for being on. It was a joy to have you. We will uh, be talking about Mary Jane next episode, 
And that is going to be a very special episode. That's going to be episode 30 of the show, finishing out the month of March. I am bound and determined to have that for you on March 31st to get three full episodes out by the end of this month. But of course, knowing how things usually go, I'll probably procrastinate and be a day or two late. We'll see how that goes. In the meantime, if you want to contact the show, you can do so a variety of ways. We have our email address at AmazingSpidermanClassics at gmail.com. All emails are read on the air. We did some today. We're going to do some again either next episode or the one after. And then there is the website where you can download the show. You can also leave comments on the episode postings, and you'll find a link there to our Facebook page where you can like to follow updates for the show as new episodes are released or other noteworthy news items are announced. You can also leave comments on the Facebook page, make fun of Josh or Don. If you make fun of me, I'm going to kick you out of the show, but you know, you can take your chances if you want. And also, we always enjoy receiving reviews on iTunes. Go to iTunes and search Amazing Spider-Man Classics, subscribe to the show there, leave a review, and tell the world what you think about the show. Always appreciate it whenever a listener does that. So until next time, that wraps up this episode. Thank you very much for listening to Amazing Spider-Man Classics in association with SpiderManCrawlspace.com. My name is John Wilson. Good night. That's pretty solid cover. What would you think? Yeah. No, it's definitely action-packed. Um, we lost Josh, though. <laughs> Hold on one second. <laughs> it's uh, that action-packed. <laughs> it's so amazing, it knocked him right off the call. Yeah. He's flying backwards and being turned into a tree. That's a Japanese Power Ranger reference for no one who will get it. I mean, when James Bond wrote Octopussy, he knew exactly what he was writing. When James, I mean, Bond, he, he, uh, when James Bond did him write Octopussy, Ian Fleming wrote it. When Ian Fleming wrote Octopussy, he knew exactly what he was doing with that title. Josh, what's your Wi-Fi situation like at Denny's? When do they close? Do you not know what Denny's is? The yeah, Mighty so that Avengers, was... my Batuka. I actually kind of feel like, okay, so we have a lot of people who listen to this show who really, really like it. And then we have them on, and they find out just how, you know, just how we are whenever the mic's not turned on, you know? Or oh, when the record's not turned are. on. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm yeah. all disorganized, and I, you know, I, I'm making stupid comments here and there that I edit out later and everything else. And so it's just like, you know, do people actually want to come back to this? But, um, but the Avengers, yeah, I mean, they're the Avengers.